Kathy, Chris Williams, uh, Carol, Ben, Beth. Councillor Kerrigan, I'm Councillor Winograd, Councillor David Off. No way, I'm not going. Anderson. Anderson. I get it. Yeah. Okay. I see okay. two that say town council. Um, Facebook Live. Okay. And, um, let Actually live. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome everybody to our, our first meeting of the Special Advisory Committee on Economic and Workforce Recovery. Uh, this is just a, uh, a quick um, overview of, of what we're doing in case people, people aren't aware. So on May 18th, um, I announced that I would uh, have two special advisory committees uh, that would help us to uh, recover uh, and reopen, um, but also to continue to respond to the needs of our community. Um, and I'm just gonna read a little bit. Uh, in the midst of very difficult times, it's been remarkable watching the West Hartford community pull together and find new ways to help and protect each other. Now the town needs to put a place in structure that is based on the spirit of community and resilience. These special advisory committees will be a platform and a venue for listening to our community members, for responding to their needs, and for supporting the incredible ongoing work of our town employees, our healthcare workers, first responders, and others. Uh, together, we can reopen in a way that is both healthy and safe. Uh, we can position West Hartford to come out of this crisis stronger than ever. Uh, and so that is the, the reasoning for us to, to have these committees uh, and allows us uh, the really important uh, and crucial, really, task of uh, engaging our community members, making sure that our community is invested and connected to all the recovery efforts. Uh, and we are, this is a, a platform for us to listen and understand. Um, and that is what is at the center of this particular committee's work. Uh, the two committees, uh, first one was uh, met last week. Uh, it was the Special Advisory Committee on Social and Community Recovery. I'll just tell you what that one is. That's responsible for evaluating quality of life issues, inclu including social needs with regard to physical health, mental well-being, food security, child care and education, quality of life matters, and more. It will also be responsible for joint deliberations with the Board of Education to consider needs of West Hartford school age population. Um, and that is uh, co-chaired uh, with uh, myself and Councillor Lamb Sweeney, uh, which the chairs are more like a facilitator than a chair. Um, we hope that every councillor will contribute equally and fully um, as, as well um, as our community members. Um, councillors also includes Carol Blanks and Mary Fay. Uh, and this this committee where you're where you are tonight uh, is the special advisory committee on economic and workforce recovery uh, that is responsible for evaluating the needs of West Hartford's businesses, nonprofits, and workforce as a result of the pandemic. And we'll make recommendations focused on reopening the town's economy and allowing businesses and nonprofits to operate in a way that is healthy and safe. Uh, this is co-chaired uh, with Leon Davidoff, uh, who will uh, actually run pretty much the rest of this meeting, right, Leon? And um, and also uh, Lee Gold, Beth Kerrigan, Ben Winograd, and Chris Williams. Uh, and so um, I just want to to um, say that this is a this is a difficult phase that we're in. I, I always said when we were sort of closing down, um, the, the decisions were 
hard, but they were clear. And uh, and I had heard early on with a group of other mayors saying that if you've made the decision and it's easy, it's too late. You've made a mistake. It should have always been pulling and really, really hard to make those decisions. So now it's a it's a little bit uh, it's squishier, uh, and it depends on our community and how prepared and. Um, and uh, cooperative uh, and compliant our community is in in protecting each other and continue continuing to protect each other. So um, I have said that I really want all of these committees to be framed uh, with the start on this health crisis that has created an economic crisis. But we are in a health crisis, and without responding and listening to the health data uh, and the facts on the ground, uh, we will not be governed uh, or not led in, in the right way. So um, that's why we are um, tend to, to start once we get to the agenda, we will start with our, our, um, our director of our, our executive director of our health district, um, West Hartford Bloomfield Health District. Um, so that is sort of, uh, I, I kind of squished um, several things together there, B and D on our on our agenda. That's the opening remarks and a bit of a scope of our work. Um, introductions we have uh, with us, actually, I'm going to kick it over to Leon um, because he helped to do this agenda and we will, um, he, Leon can make the introductions. Thank you all for being with us uh, tonight. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Um, and I appreciate everyone uh, joining the call this evening. Uh, it's my intention that uh, we uh, will just work in a very um, expeditious fashion, though be thorough, so that uh, we value everyone's time and commitment. And it's uh, my hope this evening that we could uh, wrap things up by, by 8 o'clock. Um, so Sherry introduced everyone on the call uh, so far. And, uh, and I think she, uh, she might have mentioned who's here from town staff. If not, Mr. Hart, would you like to introduce who's here uh, from town staff, as well as invited guests? That would be helpful. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Matt Hart, town manager. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the inaugural meeting of this committee. Uh, from town staff tonight, we have with us Mark McGovern, our Director of Community Development. We have Kristen Gorski, our economic development specialist. We have Brian uh, Pudlick, our zoning enforcement officer. The mayor already mentioned our health director, Amy Krause, has joined us tonight. And if I could ask uh, Ms. Gorski to just briefly introduce a couple of folks we have invited to speak about um, some of the workforce issues through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Ms. Korski. Great, thank you, Matt. So I would like to introduce um, two people who have been uh, able to join us tonight, and they are both from Capital Workforce Partners. Um, Mohamed Chowki, who is their business engagement uh, lead at Capital Workforce Partners, um, as well as Ben Clapp, um, who serves as the business services representative with the American Job Center. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, I also see uh, my former colleague, uh, Chuck Corsi, as an invited guest to uh, speak uh, about our arts community. And I know that uh, Minority Leader Gold has invited the headmaster from uh, Kingswood Oxford School, uh, Tom Dillo, to join us. So welcome, everyone, uh, for being here. Uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, ask our uh, executive director of the Bloomfield West Hartford uh, Health District, Amy Kraus, to give us an update as to the um, status of the pandemic here in, in West Hartford. Amy. Thank you. Uh, Amy Kraus with the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District. So currently, um, the town of West Hartford has 2,634 um, individuals that have gone to get tested for COVID. Out of that number, um, 616 have tested positive. There have been 114 deaths associated with COVID-19. Um, so when we look at the data, 29.1% are aged uh, 80 or greater, 
16.3% are aged 60 to 69, and 15% are aged 50 to 59. When we also look at data, we look at the disposition of the town. So currently, the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District has been doing contact tracing. Um, that means that when we receive a positive uh, test result, we contact the individual and we start asking a series of questions um, such as employment, um, location, where you know where you might have been, if you've traveled. And so with looking at that data, um, currently we continue to follow 44.4% um, of individuals of, of West Hartford. Um, we look at data, we look at 31.6% have considered to be in our definition recovered. And that means that the, the disease has resolved. Um, unfortunately, 18.5% um, have been deceased um, from, from COVID-19. When we, again, when we look at deaths, 60.5% um, are, are deaths are associated with age 80 and greater. 22.8% um, are age 70 to 79 and 14% are age 60 to 69. So you might have seen recently in the news um, that the Department of Public Health are cleaning up some of the data. So um, when you look at data, you might have seen cases roughly in the 500 range, for instance, and now those numbers um, have changed. So there were some duplicate cases in the data, and so DPH is in the process of, of cleaning that up. Um, so we've kind of, at the health district, have weeded out some of the duplicates that we've received. Um, so that's currently probably why our number um, is at 616 cases and DPH's data is roughly at 583. So what has the health district been doing? Um, and what we've been doing is, is we've been working with um, the town zoning, um, the fire marshal, uh, the, the police department on outside dining. We've reviews, reviewed a series of restaurants um, that have made requests for the outside dining. So we've continued to do that. We've also um, been responding to complaints um, for individuals for lack of face coverings. Um, and so what we're doing is, is we're working very hard to encourage people um, as the state slowly begins to open up that you still need to wear a face covering. When you go to restaurants while you're sitting at a table, I encourage you while you before you get your food, obviously you can't, uh, you know, uh, eat with your mask on or your face covering, but I encourage you to continue to have that face covering on. It's very important. Um, so, and the reason I say that is, is because there's individuals um, that are asymptomatic. And what that means is that there's no symptoms. They feel fine. However, that they're testing positive. And so those individuals can be carriers. Um, and so what we're finding is, is that people feel fine. Um, and sometimes they're not wearing their face covering. Um, they're socializing more because the, the restrictions are being lifted and we're slowly starting to see some, some new cases pop up in different age groups now. Um, so again, I'm, I'm encouraging as the state slowly begins to open up that you're, you're wearing your face covering and you're still doing your physical distancing. So last time we spoke, we talked about um, some waves of COVID. Originally, I had mentioned um, that the Department of Public Health, specifically Dr. Matt Carter, had talked about the waves of COVID. Um, currently, we were in a wave. The next wave was supposed to be in the fall. And then the final wave, hopefully the final wave, was supposed to be in spring of 2021. So as the state begins to open up, that wave has changed a little bit. So now we're looking at possibly August um, instead of the fall being the next wave. So that's a little concerning to public health officials, especially as we move into flu season. Um, so like um, COVID, we were encouraging people to stay home if you were sick, contact your physician because we didn't want to um, crowd our hospitals. And so with flu season, we are strongly gonna be working on our public health message to have people get your flu shot. The health district provides those vaccines. Um, we're able to bill insurance companies. I encourage people um, to make an appointment, come see us at the health district. The money that we're able to get goes back into community and, and community programs. Um, so again, the health district's leaning forward with, with the anticipation of a vaccine um, and also the flu vaccine. We're working hard um, with Bob McHugh, um, Chief Priest, and, and others as far as doing drive-through clinics um, for this fall. We're doing them in both towns, Bloomfield and West Hartford. So we're leaning forward in anticipation of that. 
Um, our office is going to start to open next week um, again to start vaccinating people for outstanding vaccines that they've been missing. Um, for instance, a Shingrix shot is a series of two shots. And so um, if you don't meet the second shot, you have to start the series over again. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly open our office and, and start vaccinating again. Um, so again, I'm, I'm also looking to, um, as you've heard, um, we want to continue to try to increase our testing capacity. I'm currently working on options to try to get more testing um, over in the Hillcrest area, over in New Britain Ave. Um, currently, right now in West Hartford, we don't have any pharmacies that are that are testing. Um, they're not in our in our areas. What we're doing is we're relying on the hospitals, the drive-throughs, and also some urgent care centers. Um, so I'm exploring some options to hopefully get some mobile mobile uh, testing in that area. But I'd be happy to answer any questions um, if you had any. Uh, uh, Mr. Winograd. Uh, thank you, Mr. David. Um, I mean, uh, I'm so confused now um, over another governor announced this morning um, that we're not getting enough testing done. Um, but I looked to the website. I, I, I still can't figure out who should get tested now. Um, should someone I mean, obviously, anybody who's a first responder or you know, nursing home employee. Um, but should your should people who are otherwise not at risk um you take getting it just for data i mean you know should i get it should my family get it who haven't had that much contact with other people sure great question um currently again i i'm encouraging people um to get tested if if you feel um that you've could have been exposed um, if you're not working from home, um, if you've made trips to grocery stores. Um, again, I, 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 the concern is, is that there could be a higher number of asymptomatic people that are carriers. Um, you know, we are seeing that in our data now. It's now not just people that have a fever, a cough, and shortness of breath. Um, we are seeing other symptoms associated with COVID. We're seeing people that have no symptoms, um, that they've gone and gotten tested. So again, I've, I've encouraged people, you know, to look at the town of West Hartford's website. Um, we do have a list of, of area providers that are willing to get uh, to do the testing. Um, if you're unable to, to find that list, you know, please reach out to me. I will help you um, find a place. Um, we're working very closely with our providers in town in our urgent care centers. Um, we are working currently with one in Bloomfield um, that is looking to assist people that are unable to get out and get tested. They're willing to work with us to um, get the individual tested if they can't leave their home. Um, so that's great progress, both for the health district and for our two towns. So yes, to answer your question, I'm encouraging people. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's going to help slow down um, the virus. Um, it's going to contain it. Um, we're going to continue not to try to transmit the virus. You know, again, we have community widespread community transmission. We see that with our numbers. Um, so again, yes, I would encourage it. And if you can't find that testing site, please let me know. Uh, thank you, Ms. Krause. Any further questions of the health director? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Amy, for uh, giving us the facts and, and the science behind it and uh, keeping our community informed and I think I speak on behalf of all my colleagues that uh, you're doing an amazing job just started as our executive director of of the health district and who would have thought that this would be your your first uh, task uh, but you've met the challenge ha head on and uh, I know that uh, we feel very confident with you your leadership and your knowledge uh, to keep our community safe and and that's what makes our community uh, stand out amongst all the others so thank you and no, uh, should you feel true. free to leave the call, you can because uh, your portion of the meeting has ended. And as we go through the meeting, as your portion has ended, also feel free to uh, to leave the call and, and do what you need to do in your own personal lives. But we appreciate your time. Uh, you. With that said, um, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Mr. Hart, who can uh, frame hopefully the um, Capital Workforce Partners uh, portion of the agenda. Happy to do that, Deputy Mayor, uh, Matt Hart, Town Manager. And I, I see that she's uh, left the call, but I would also extend 
my thanks to, to Ms. Krause. I also serve as the uh, currently the chair of the West Hartford Bloomfield Health District, and, and she's done an amazing job over the past several months. So Capital Workforce Partner is very pleased that they can join our call this evening. You know, Ms. Gorski has been working on that, working with them in uh, several key capacities. We, we all know and can appreciate uh, how hard the, uh, the virus has hit. Certain aspects of, of our economy, our, our business community, also our nonprofit community, our arts community, uh, capital workforce partners, they, they play a critical role in, uh, in our region. You know, they serve West Hartford and a number of capital region communities. Uh, they've done that for many, many years, and uh, they've been working on some initiatives specific to COVID-19. Um, I know Mayor Cantor, through the Capital Region, also has a, uh, a strong interest in employment opportunities for our young people. You know, when you think about it, um, folks who are either in college or older high school students, you know, their employment opportunities for this summer have been dramatically, dramatically diminished with, with the onset of the virus. And I know that's something that the mayor and others are very sensitive to, and, and we've been working with uh, capital workforce partners on, uh, on those issues as well. So I think what I'd like to do now, uh, Mr. Davidoff, is turn to Ms. Gorski she can talk a little bit about the work that her office has been doing in a partnership with uh, her colleagues at Capital Workforce Partners, and then we can hear from Mohammed and Benjamin. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Ms. Korski. Thank you, Mr. Davidoff, um, and thank you, Mr. Hart. Um, so. You know, I also see that Chuck Corsi is on tonight's call. Um, it feels like a very long time ago when Chuck Corsi, myself and Chris Conway from the chamber met at the Hartford facility with Muhammad as well as Ben to talk about many of the initiatives that we've been working on with our businesses as well as nonprofits for uh, workforce development. Um, it was probably about three, three uh, uh, months ago, it seems like a year. Um, so we were chatting about that earlier today. Um, but, you know, I, I think what's most important for this committee to hear is a lot of the really positive things that Capital Workforce Partners, as well as American Job Centers, a lot of these valuable resources that they can provide both the residents in getting them back to work, as well as our businesses with opportunities such as furloughing and keeping people on payroll, as well as them being able to uh, create solutions for our businesses in any sort of challenging needs. Um, so with that uh, very brief introduction, I will hand it over to Ben and Mohammed. Uh, thank you, Ms. Korski. Uh, I don't know if Ben or Mohammed want, want to go first. Just raise your hand and I'll call on you to say who wants to go first. I'll go first. Uh... Thank, Thank you, you Mohammed. Just uh, state your name and your title for so people can have an understanding as as to where you're, where you're from. Uh, Mohammed Chauki. Um, just remember, Mohammed Chauki is a tougher last name to remember. <laughs> uh, business engagement lead at Capital Workforce Partners, and um, I really want to start by thanking Kristen for spearheading these efforts to engage us and uh, inv invite us to this very very important event and. Uh, uh, this is this is what every town should be doing proactively, not reactively. And this is great. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. So uh, to some of the folks on the room, I'll just uh, give a quick overview about what Capital Workforce Partner is all about and then pass on the microphone to my colleague, uh, Benjamin Clapp. So we are one of five regional workforce investment board, although we are a small uh, states, but we are very impactful uh, when it comes to workforce uh, to the rest of the nation, if not the world. Uh, and we are one of five workforce investment boards serving the 37 towns in the north central region of the state of Connecticut. Uh, we oversee the American Job Centers. There is eight of them. Um, and uh, we work closely with uh, our colleagues at the Department of Labor. So um, a strong workforce is vital uh, to the region's fiscal health and sustainability. 
and uh, we if there's a if there's a mission that we uh, try to do and succeed in is to find in helping businesses find in retain and growing a qualified workforce and every time uh, we say that the importance of workforce development and uh, and the importance of a workforce investment board we are proven wrong because there's one event after the other that shows that it is our role is crucial and uh, we we try to fill in that gap so uh, like I said we manage over uh, the American job centers in in uh, in eight locations we usually get a traffic of about 18 to 19,000 people every year uh, we're probably going to see a larger number than that um, as we are contributing to these recovery efforts it takes a village. We are not uh, a one-man show, one-woman show. We are working closely with many organizations, educational and others. Uh, we work closely with Department of Labor, uh, DECD, um, and we are trying to serve both the young, uh, the young adults and the job seekers who are uh, attending our centers. Um, so yeah, we we're probably going to see we're probably going to see a lot of people come into our centers once um, everything goes back to normal. Hopefully we're manifesting that. But right now we are still operating virtually. Um, staff from, that used to uh, work from all these American Job Center are still accessible. And um, that's we'll continue to do that. Um, so yeah, we are uh, the um, um, designated Workforce Investment Board for this region. And uh, we work closely with chief elected officials in each of these 37 towns in the North Central region um, and with the mission to play the middle partner here by helping job seekers get all the training that they need to fill in the jobs that the employers need filled. Um, and these strategies have impacted communities in the past positively and will continue to impact um, and West Hartford has been a great partner in, in throughout this. And uh, according to what Matt said earlier, it's it's painful that uh, the summer youth program it, it is here, but it's uh, we want to make sure we are giving our youth all the resources uh, that, that they need to build on their talent and continue operating business as usual. So um, one thing, I, I was on a phone call earlier uh, with the Department of Labor, and we are pushing that all the Workforce Investment Board in partnership with Indeed, we will be hosting, uh, they will be hosting on our behalf, but we're promoting to many businesses across the state uh, a, a job fair, a virtual job fair host, uh, facilitated by Indeed. And I'll send more information about that so that the businesses from West Hartford are aware of this, they can move on to hire and folks, uh, constituents of West Hartford know about employers that are hiring in their towns and move on to, uh, to you know, applying and getting a job. This is how we're going to restart the economy in, in the states. And we want to make sure that employers that are hiring, um, you know, are given the platform to, uh, to qualify job seekers. And last but not least, there are some programs, and I think uh, my colleague Benjamin will touch more on this programs that offset training costs. There are folks that be, they'll, will be coming from industries that are dying out, but they will be looking for uh, new sectors to join into. And there are some programs that help off, help the employer offset the training costs uh, so, so that that person addresses the learning curve and is productive at their new job. So we want to make sure these uh, opportunities are known to the businesses in West Hartford. And uh, this is our way of advocating for training and for employment of, of people that are uh, in dire need to get back to the workforce. With that said, uh, I'm probably, uh, just in case uh, I think of something else, I'm gonna have my colleague uh, Benjamin Clapp uh, join now and talk about the American Job Center, talk about our business services, talk about um, our role in the community and uh, programs that Matt, that 
will help and probably further dwell on the on the dislocated worker grant this is the program that i just mentioned seconds ago that it helps folks that were just impacted with a la with a layoff or were impacted even prior to covid 19 with a layoff and are looking to get back to the workforce but they need the advocacy they need an employer to understand that training is crucial before this 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 uh, covid 19 we had a lot of job openings. It was not a job issue, it was a skills issue. It will continue to be a skills issue that we're working hard to address with the partners like the ECD, like DOL, like DSS, like the educational institutions throughout our state. But um, uh, we'll be happy to do that. Without further, you know, I wanna mention, uh, make sure that uh, Benjamin uh, jumps on right now and uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, you definitely provided insight into uh, things that I just learned about and I think others did as well. And uh, I think that it will be a key partnership with our residents and those who are uh, seeking new employment opportunities as we work our way through this, uh, this crisis. Uh, with that said, uh, Benjamin. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. I just want to thank uh, Kristen again for inviting us to this platform. Uh, as well as Chris Conway, although I know he's not here today, he's been a great partner for us in the chamber. Um, I know everyone is uh, very busy, so I will try to keep it as brief as possible, and I certainly do not want to gild the lily on the heels of my colleague Mohammed. but just a little bit about the American Job Center and kind of where we began in Capital Workforce Partners uh, leaves off. Uh, Capital Workforce Partners really drives the strategic vision of the local workforce development for the 37 municipalities in the Capital Region. And the American Job Center is really where we do that work uh, in the trenches, in the front lines. Uh, the American Job Center is basically a national network of career one-stop centers uh, throughout the United States. Um, as far as services uh, for job seekers, I'll just expand slightly on some of those resources. Um, we have uh, universal services that really any job seeker can take advantage of at our job center. Um, I'm going to speak a little more traditionally from the perspective of our brick and mortar job centers, as Mohammed alluded. Uh, we are operational, albeit uh, not presently physically open at our centers, uh, but traditionally in our job centers, uh, one might find uh, postings for job opportunities, uh, workshops facilitated through the Department of Labor, um, assisted technology for anyone who may have a disability, uh, as well as access to computers. Um, certainly, we have those universal services for anyone who walks through our door, regardless of their employment status. Uh, but above and beyond that, we also support some more intensive programming as well. Uh, one example is uh, a program called the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. It's a federal program signed into legislation in 2015. Uh, another program we offer in conjunction with the state of Connecticut, specifically DSS, is called the Job First Employment Services Program which is essentially a program for folks receiving uh, temporary assistance for needy families. As a condition of that assistance, uh, they may be mandated by DSS to engage with their job center. Um, what basically happens when someone is receiving these intensive services is that uh, first off, we, we, we do an assessment. We, you know, we like to see where they're at, where their uh, math and reading skills are. Uh, we typically will pair them up with what's called a career advisor. Um, which is essentially a, a career counselor, uh, case manager, spirit guide, cheerleader, all of the above, to kind of really on an individualized basis see what the need is and come up with an employment plan to, to meet that need. Uh, not everyone comes to us in the same circumstances, so we want to really try and individualize as early on in the process as possible. Um, my job title, I'm what's called a business services representative, so much like Mohammed, I work very closely with employers uh, I'm on the supply side trying to refer qualified job seekers to those opportunities. Um, I actually work in support of a specific federal grant. Uh, my grant is called the National Dislocated Worker Grant. I can prepare all of these resources in an email so no one needs to take notes. But um, essentially, it's a grant designed to offer hiring incentives uh, in high growth sectors. So a lot of our offerings are driven by labor market data. Uh, we're trying to transition people who have found themselves out of work um, back to a high growth area. And through this dislocated worker grant, uh, a dislocated worker being a designation the Department of Labor has, uh, it's traditionally someone who's a layoff victim. And as you can probably imagine, um, due to the turmoil from this outbreak, you know that, that designation is going to be applied much more broadly than it had been prior. Um, a couple points that I, I do also wanna mention just briefly, um, a few resources. 
first off, uh, there is a job board uh, that's free of charge for job seekers and employers. Uh, it's www.cthires.com. Again, I can share this via email after our meeting. Uh, it's a free job board, so any employer who might be looking can post their opportunities free of charge. Uh, but just as importantly, any job seeker in the market can not only create a profile, but publish a resume, look for job opportunities, uh, and navigate some of the offerings we have at our job centers. Um, of course, you know many are probably familiar with the Department of Labor's uh, phone number for unemployment insurance. Um, you know, I, I, I don't need to um, uh, poke the elephant in the room, but certainly, you know, they're they're trying to adjust to the uh, bandwidth that they're facing right now with unemployment inquiries and questions. Uh, but if anyone were ever interested, I can share that phone number, uh, 860-263-6000. Uh, that's where anyone can call and speak with someone directly with the Department of Labor to find questions or answers to their unemployment claims. We know that that's a challenge sometimes getting through because they are seeing, uh, obviously, a normal volume. Uh, so I also want to share that the American Job Centers have a hotline, a call center as well. Um, it is available to the general public. Uh, we actually have staff allocated to answer those calls uh, live Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that phone number, I'll email it as well, but it is 860-406-3374. And if someone were to call after hours, we have an answering service where we can certainly call people back as quickly as possible. Um, an initiative that we're also very excited about, and some of you may have known, is Skill Up Connecticut. Uh, this is an initiative that's been uh, introduced earlier this month from the Governor's Workforce Council, uh, operating in tandem with the five regional workforce investment boards in the Connecticut Department of Labor. Uh, this is essentially uh, a, a cost-free platform through which those who have found themselves out of work due to the outbreak uh, will have access to what is normally licensed-based online training, uh, where they can choose from thousands of courses to offer them industry-recognized credentials and certifications. Uh, I will share the link to that as well. I won't uh, tie up everyone's time spelling it out, but uh, that's a huge initiative right now. As Mohammed said, you know, really our key mission is to make sure we can skill up people uh, so that they have a sustainable career pathway in the long run. Um, lastly, uh, one additional point I would like to make is that uh, right now at present, uh, although our centers are closed, uh, we are working with the Department of Labor to um, establish an online enrollment process so that individuals who may want to look into the Federal Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act program and its incumbent services uh, can actually begin to pursue enrolling in that program remotely uh, until uh, very recently someone would have to physically come to our center to enroll in that. Uh, as you can imagine, there are some eligibility components. Uh, there's a lot of secure and, and frankly private documents that we need to obtain from those individuals. And uh, right now, we're just in the final throes of making sure we have a secure platform. Obviously, we want to respect people's privacy uh, and not put anyone in a bad position through that. Um, finally, you know, I, I think to, to kind of get to the larger sense, uh, I know it's a cliche, people say we're in this together, but at the end of the day, it really does take a village. Um, I hope I can, you know, again, uh, sufficiently express my gratitude as well as Mohammed's for being involved in today's call and hopefully an ongoing partnership. Uh, we're immensely grateful for the time. So thank you, uh, committee, and thank you, Kristen. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, thank you, Kristen and, and Mohammed. I think uh, what you highlighted is exactly what we're tasked to do, is try to reach out to those who have the expertise, the knowledge, the skill sets, the information that our residents are looking for. Um, and it's great that we heard it this evening, but what I think that my initial takeaway is that we need to somehow find a way on our town website to tab this information so that our residents uh, can go there easily, uh, click uh, a link of somehow to, to get there. They obviously don't speak the same lingo that uh, we heard this evening. And for a lot of people, that's uh, a trepidation uh, triggers and, uh, and things like that. So whatever we can do to make it easier and to, to form some type of synergy and, and a strategy to, to keep people uh, with opportunities to, to get employment uh, and to alleviate some of their fears as they uh, work their way through this uh, crisis is quite helpful. But uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of, out of your life to share with us the uh, resources that are available in our region. And uh, it's really incumbent upon us as uh, policymakers to uh, make certain that we can uh, translate that into things that uh, members of our community uh, can can do and use uh, Miss Korsky. 
Thank you, Mr. Davidoff. Um, I would just like to let the committee know, so um, there is a link up on the economic development webpage for Capital Workforce Partners, and as well as some of the programs that they offer. Um, I agree with you from the sense of, let's make it more prominent um, and more well-known um, specifically to our residents. So we'll work on uh, achieving that. I appreciate it and whatever we can do in terms of, uh, you know, press releases, getting it out into the media to let people know that there's something there that they should look at, uh, that would be a really good first step. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, also acknowledge our mayor, who I, I know was instrumental in uh, uh, forming uh, this committee and uh, having as a major component workforce recovery because uh, uh, the mayor understood immediately that uh, any type of uh, solution to the crisis would uh, require um, residents uh, to be gainfully employed whether it be in the uh, job that they were uh, doing before this or any new opportunity uh, that uh, will be necessary as we uh, work through the crisis. And uh, and for that, I'm grateful for, for her foresight and uh, her leadership. Does anyone else have any questions or comments with respect to uh, anything with the uh, Capital Workforce Partners or with American Jobs? Well, I, I see uh, scanning the, uh, the Brady Bunch grid here. Uh, nobody does. So thank you, uh, uh, Mohammed and Benjamin, for your time. Thank you, Kristen, again, uh, for, for your efforts. And uh, uh, please keep in touch with us. Uh, we definitely want to be one of those proactive communities, not a reactive community. And uh, we will definitely be in touch uh, as we learn more and as more opportunities present themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is a communication with our arts community, and I'd like to uh, call upon uh, Chuck Corsi to uh, give us an update as to uh, steps that are been taken with the various arts organizations. I know you've been working with Mayor Cantor prior to this on uh, the creation of an arts commission in town, one that uh, was desperately uh, needed before this. So it seems like a lot of the things we were working on before this situation, okay, so that just really shows you that our community is, is forward thinking, but more so than ever, we really do need um, expertise and volunteers willing to, to step up to the plate and uh, do the hard work and connect uh, people together to see what we can do for the betterment of our community. With that said, uh, Chuck. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, and thank you to all everybody on the phone. Uh, I've always known that West Hartford is a great uh, special community. Uh, and it's easy to do your jobs and be uh, very effective when times are good. It's when times are bad that really shows the community's uh, strength and, and the, the strength of our uh, political leaders and our, our great uh, town staff. And uh, you guys have done just a fabulous job. I'm, I'm awfully proud to be a, a member of this community. Um, I thought what I'd first do, uh, Leon, is, is just give you a little bit of background about how these we got all these different arts organizations together. Um, about uh, last um, fall, uh, the mayor had uh, asked me to take a look at helping to kind of re-energize uh, the mayor's charity ball. We had had, uh, um, it's a, a great community event. Uh, the, the, the work on putting on the, the ball each year uh, usually fell on the organization that was uh, the beneficiary. Uh, and that uh, created some problems, uh, especially when you had multiple beneficiaries and some uh, worked harder than others. Uh, but in, in trying to reimagine what the ball could be, uh, we had many meetings with stakeholders, people who had worked and volunteered on the mayor's ball in the past. Um, and what one of the things that became evident is we needed a, a bigger group of volunteers um, and uh, People, we started to coalesce around the idea of having uh, the beneficiaries and, and the ball go towards arts and culture organizations um, in West Hartford. Um, we Those discussions had been going along very well. Um, we were not planning uh, to have a ball this coming fall, which was uh, clairvoyant, <laughs> probably. But um, once the, uh, the, the virus hit, um, all these organizations to different uh, degrees had immediate needs. And again, this is not under, you talked a little bit about the potential commission and we can talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. 
but this is not done under the auspices of the town. These, uh, I know for years that um, folks have tried to get all the arts and culture commissions to collaborate together. Uh, sometimes it's been relatively successful, but for the most part, everybody kind of does their own thing. Uh, but uh, I'll just tell you the groups that have come together, and these are the arts and culture organizations that we're all aware of, and, and really they're, they're 501c3s um, and c4s that uh, uh, have uh, a presence in West Hartford. We have uh, obviously the Art League, uh, the Playhouse and Park, uh, the West Hartford Symphony. Uh, I see Tom uh, Dillo on the, the phone, led by uh, my former choir teacher and uh, an institution over at Kingswood Oxford, Richard Sharapa, uh, West Hartford uh, Community Theater, the West Hartford Women's Chorale, uh, Ballet Theater Company, the Noel Webster House and Historical Society, and Connecticut Family Theater. Um, as you can imagine, there are different degrees, uh, these organizations, uh, different degrees of needs that some of these organizations are facing. Organizations like the Symphony, uh, West Hartford Community Theater, the Women's Chorale, uh, their events and their expenses are really tied to their events. So while it's very disappointing that they had to can cancel concerts, um, they are not in, in any danger of um, going away, per se. Um, if, uh, if um, you know, hopefully at, at some point in the near future, uh, people are going to be able to come together in large groups uh, to, to see these kind of concerts and performances. But the real immediate need was with organizations like the Playhouse, Ballet Theater Company, the Art League, and uh, uh, West Hartford uh, uh, Connecticut Family Theater. Uh, and we've really, in, um, in the No Wester House as well, these are organizations that depend on audiences they have uh, monthly expenses that have not gone away. Uh, they have employees that they did not want to have to furlough. Uh, and they, you know, probably most importantly, they pray, play a vital role in our town. Um, there's a, a study, a national study about the arts and culture for every dollar invested in buying a ticket of admission or to an exhibit, uh, to a concert, to a play, there's an additional three dollars that are spent in that community, so that's these these are not just great arts and culture organizations. They're little mini economic engines for our community, and I, I'm sure you all agree it would be a terrible thing uh, to lose any of these organizations. So what have we done in the last couple of months? Um, I, I've sent you a packet of information. Uh, one has a listing of uh, the organizations and contact uh, information. Another is um, a letter that we sent to um, our uh, to Derek and Tammy, uh, Jillian and Joe, uh, as well as to uh, Senator Blumenthal, Senator Murphy's office, and Congressman Larson's office. We had Zoom calls with all of them. Uh, we had a joint call with our, our delegation in Hartford, and then individual ones with each individual member of uh, Congress. Uh, to impress upon them the challenges that we're facing. And again, the challenges uh, that those organizations that really are most impacted uh, is what is what is to become of theater, of ballet, of choir, of, of these performances if we are going to have these limitations on crowd size going into the future. Um, I'll tell you, uh, and it, uh, let me just jump. The, the other um, uh, document they send you was a detailed summary from uh, the Webster House, the Art League, the Playhouse, and Ballet Theater Company, some background on their institutions, but then how COVID has impacted uh, their organization. Um, if, if organizations like, uh, you know, just take the Playhouse, for example, if they're allowed to put on shows, but they can only but they have to practice social distancing uh, in their theater. You know, it's a, it seats 162. They can't make a go of it if they can only have 30 or 40 people in for each show. Uh, that doesn't cover their expenses. Uh, and by no means am I here or any of them to advocate 
you know, loosening of any social distancing rules. They are all the thing that's most important to them is the health and, and well-being of uh, of their customers and their patrons. Uh, what they're looking for is help in getting from now until we're able to open the doors to larger audiences. Um, <clears throat> so we've, we've had meetings with, with all of our uh, representatives. We've been active on social media, started our own uh, Facebook page. We actually have a website that is just about ready to go live. Again, it's not under the town's umbrella, although at some point, if that's something that uh, the town and the council think is appropriate, uh, we do too. Uh, but it's it's a landing page where a one-stop shopping where you can go on and, and have access to all the other arts and culture organizations in West Hartford. Um, we have weekly uh, calls with all the members, uh, sometimes more than once a week, where probably has been the most effective use of time because that way we're able to share with one another what access to capital and money has been uh, successful, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, unlike a lot of the big theater, um, theaters in, in uh, the state and uh, art institutions, these organizations don't have huge endowments. They don't own, in most cases, they don't own the uh, property where they uh, reside. So they have no collateral to go out and get loans. And even if they were able to go out and get loans, it's not in their best interest to be saddled with uh, an expense, expensive uh, loan repayment. I mean, these these uh, organizations are not, uh, they're operating on very tight budgets. Um, so um, that makes it all the, all the more important that, um, you know, we, we try and help them find some sort of solution that can get to where we're at now to when they can open their doors. The good news is none of these organizations are going to close uh, anytime in the next uh, couple of months. They're doing a lot of creative things uh, to provide art and culture to our communities. Um, you know, go. I'd encourage you to go on our Facebook page to see some of them. But uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Jen Matos's uh, armchair tours of uh, West Hartford history that uh, she's been doing. Uh, the Ballet Theater Company has been doing free classes um, for some of the at-risk um, uh, uh, students that they had. Uh, the Playhouse is also doing the same. Darlene Zoller does a, a workout class, a dance class, every day. Uh, I believe it's at noon. I'm not sure of the time. That's one I have not uh, taken part in for obvious reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to fulfill their mission. Um, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough. I worry about uh, many of them. I worry about Ballet Theater Company, the Playhouse, um, it's especially uh, Connecticut Family Theater. Um, so I, you know, I don't want to bore you. you can, the document, the uh, West Hartford Arts and Culture Collaborative Background and uh, Pandemic Impact, that gives you a pretty good summary of where they're at, what they've accessed, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and yeah, that's uh, we call ourselves the West Hartford Arts and Culture Collaborative, and it's a great name because they really are doing uh, a great job of working together. I think in, in years past, um, some of these organizations might have seen each other as uh, competitors for people's entertainment money, uh, but now they've really come together, uh, and it's um, it's it's very uh, heartening to see how well they work together uh, for the common good. So with that, I, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. If you want to talk about the, the commission uh, thoughts, um, I'd be more than happy to talk about that as well. Uh, thank you, Chuck. So I, I think it's no secret that the arts are, are very special to our community, our residents. Uh, it draws so many people uh, to our town who aren't residents. Our, our businesses are connected uh, with uh, arts that uh, that fit their profile. So we're so interconnected on this uh, spectrum with respect to uh, how important the arts are in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives. Uh, we encourage our, our children to get involved at an early age, uh, to have an appreciation of the arts. And um, it, it's, it's something that uh, makes West Hartford uh, unique in the sense that we have all those institutions that uh, you listed, uh, listed there. So 
what I think uh, this committee could be probably helpful uh, to do and to be tasked with was would be to see how we can uh, work collaboratively with you to uh, find uh, resources or partners uh, who may be willing to uh, find ways that are creative out of the box to um, connect uh, during this time and uh, mm -hmm. see if they have resources that they can they can provide because that particular institution may hold a special place in, in their heart and in their soul because, as you said, th th these things aren't going to go away and it's something that we, we treasure. So um, what we need to do is find ways that we can make that connection with our residents and with um, the leaders of these institutions to, to find that pathway so that they can uh, communicate uh, their needs and, and see if there's those in our community who can um, sustain them and, and, and make them keep them viable during this this period of time. So um, I think there's opportunities there that uh, can definitely be explored. Obviously, you're going to share that uh, link of, to that new landing page and, and make a big splash when, when that does go live because I think uh, that's important uh, for people. So the common theme that I've already heard in the first two things are there's a lot happening. Uh, it's just our um, need to connect and get that information out to people to let them know that our community is still vibrant. Uh, there's people working on things, even though we're doing things a little differently, there's still a way to uh, become attached and, and remain involved. And, and I think that's a, a positive message. And during this time, people are looking for positive messages uh, to put their uh, creative abilities uh, to use their, their financial resources if they have the means to, to assist. So uh, thank you for, for taking on that uh, leadership of, uh, of putting this all together. And I think that um, a highlight for me was to hear how collaboratively each of the institutions uh, recognize that they are stronger together than they are apart. And that message really resonates uh, with us because even though we are apart and alone within the confines of our own homes or with our own a family, we are stronger together because we're acting as uh, one community uh, going forward through this. Does any of my colleagues have anything? Mayor Cantor, I'm, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davidoff. Um, Chuck, I just, well, first I want to say thank you uh, to Mohammed and Ben for your presentation and all you do for the state of Connecticut and our region. Um, it's, it's really, helpful and and so uh so much appreciated and thank you for being here and sharing your resources uh with us and uh, i know i know kristen's been reached out she's been working with you for a while now uh and we're so grateful for that for that partnership um and we are again as a region understanding that we all bring things to the table and so we're again much better when we're in this together so Thank you, Kristen. Also, Kristen's been very helpful on the nonprofit side, uh, and there are many jobs on the nonprofit side as well. But um, but get, trying to uh, educate the nonprofits on resources, and as Chuck said, many of them are not capitalized, don't have relationships with banks, and didn't were not able to get PPP or other things. But a couple of them did, uh, and that was really helpful. Um, but there were some small grants and other things that also were. I, you know, it was it was a little um, frenetic in the beginning of you know what was going on and you know what was happening. So that was uh, that was challenging. Um, but I think hopefully there's some going to be some more strategic funding uh, for the arts. I I really hope so. And Chuck, I there's not many citizens that do what you do. I mean, really, not just you know caring about an organization and being on a board but really diving in and leading a group and and being i've seen you be their their sort of their um you know their arrow and their uh you know sort of the captain for a while uh while the ship was uh and it is rocky but really was falling apart for a while and you gathered all the arts and uh, organizations together uh and it was so comforting for them to be able to talk to each other these three had this issue, those two had this issue, five had this issue, and it was really, really helpful. And that is, um, and 
connecting all of them and having uh, some common messages and goals will be very helpful for our community. And that's the hope that the commission will do. You know, I was frustrated that the commission wasn't up and going, obviously, before this, because it would have made those communications a little bit a little bit easier, I think, in the beginning. Uh, they're working now, and now I almost think the commission's just sort of like, okay, formal, formalizing many of those connections and engaging more residents as well. Um, we have a very generous community, and I, I do know that a lot of people just need to know how to help, uh, and so hopefully we can we can yeah. make that happen. So. Th thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, we, we do have a very, uh, and thank you for the kind words, um, we do have a very generous community. Um, <clears throat> for most of these organizations, they've, they also, they go to the, our community every day before this, uh, before uh, COVID. Um, really uh, admission and uh, tickets only account for a very, very small portion of a lot of these groups uh, budget. Uh, I think the level of support that they need though is gonna have to be more than just going to the same you know, their patrons, because a lot of them are, are tapped out. Um, it, there's a lot of worthy organizations out there that are really in trouble and need, need help. Uh, I liken the, uh, you know, arts and culture are a lot like the entertainment and hosp hospitality uh, uh, businesses that, you know, through no fault of their own, you know, you can't have a full restaurant. You know, you can't have a full concert. Uh, they're they're going to need, uh, and it's not just ours, in West Hartford, but these types of organizations are going to need some government help. And I'm not, not, not saying government as in town of West Hartford. Uh, it's from the federal government. And I, I think one one way that you guys uh, can help is, you know, we've made those initial contacts with uh, Lars, or, yeah, Larson Murphy and Blumenthal's office. Uh, some were a little bit more informed than others, but I think having the weight of the council to uh, say, look, you know, here in West Hartford, the, these groups are essential. Uh, they're not, you know, one, one, they're essential and, and we need to make sure that they survive. The, 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 one th the thing that's really been frustrating is how little money uh, the state and the feds have put aside for arts and culture. Um, I, th I think the, the federal government gave, it was less than a million dollars to the state to distribute to arts and culture organizations. That's nothing, that's nothing. I mean, there were people were spending hours and hours filling out paperwork to get 600 to $1,000. Uh, that's nothing. Um, they, they need uh, a little bit more help uh, from uh, uh, the federal and uh, state government. So we can talk more about this uh, offline, but uh, I think having the council behind us and kind of echoing that voice, uh, West Hartford is a. It's a again. It's it's a very special place, um, but I, I just I, I'm really worried that without that help from uh, federal and state government, uh, some of these great cherished organizations are not going to be around in 2021. Thank you, Chuck, and I, I think that's something we can help with. Great, thanks, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Matt Hart, Town Manager. I'd also like to thank uh, Chuck, Mr. Corsi for, for his efforts. You know, I know we want to use these meetings also um, for a little bit of brainstorming uh, idea generation. Uh, Chuck, as Leisure Services is working to provide a summer camp program, you know, and it's still, still a lot of deliberation going on in terms of what we can safely provide terms of an in-person camp, but we're also talking about what we can do with respect to a virtual camp experience. And I'm wondering if we could explore some additional partnerships with our local arts organizations um, in order to provide that experience with, with a strong West Hartford connection. Um, I know Noah Webster, for example, has had its own summer camp program for many, many years now, but maybe something could be formalized with the town, uh, maybe something with the theater, maybe with some of the other organizations as well. So I'm just tossing that idea out there. Sure. And, uh, if you have any any initial reaction. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, uh, I know, um, in addition to the Webster House, Playhouse and Park, Ballet Theater Company, and Connecticut Family Theater all have summer programs or camps. And the Art League. Um, the and the Art League. And the Art League, absolutely. Um, I think the prob- the challenge that we're having, that some of these uh, organizations are having, and I, I think it's a great idea. We can I can talk to Helen and if you'd like and, and pursue that. Uh, I think a lot of these parents are having Zoom fatigue with their children, and it's kind of like college. You know, I I have a, a, a you know like many of you have kids in college, and you know you, you look at what's the the benefit, what's the cost, you know benefit of spending the money uh, for your kid to go to camp on on Zoom. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to throw away any ideas, obviously, and I, you know I, that's definitely something I'll, I'll talk to. Uh, to uh, Helen and uh, our our members of the collaborative about to see if uh, that's something we can pursue, um, but that's that I think that's a, a, a great idea. I I'll, I will add you know um, listening to Amy's presentation uh, tonight, um, and boy what a what a great job she's doing in difficult times and in such short uh, uh, time on the uh, with the health district. I'd, I'd love to get her on on a call with our guys to our uh, members of the collaborative to talk about, um, you know, the challenges that they're facing. I think getting her input would really be helpful, reassuring, and, you know, give, give them, uh, you know, good information. Um, Chuck, without speaking on behalf of the manager, I'm certain that uh, he could uh, assist, uh, facilitate that connection. So that would be helpful so that, uh, this is something that, that's coming out of this is to find out what the need is to to get the information to the to the right people so that everybody will be on the same page. Yeah, no, I, I think having the town behind an effort to, with the camps, I think that's a, a great idea to, to pursue. Are there any other members who have a question or comment with respect, Mr. Chair? Mr. Gold. I, I just simply have a, a comment, Chuck, and thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I always look at innovative ways of trying to communicate and get get out. Obviously, we're on a uh, massive uh, WebEx call. Everybody's on Zoom. We're talking about yeah. that. I don't necessarily have children in college yet, and I have them who have been doing a lot of screen timing with Kingswood, so thank you, Tom, for that. Um, but, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here to, to truly go on to a social platform of getting the word out about your collaborative, um, you know, across, the, you know, obviously the workforce and, and truly do a like, – almost like a social media campaign uh, that links the town. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting the, the theme that I'm getting through this is a partnership and the, the entire town, each department, each uh, organization has to be in partnership. Uh, so all of this can succeed, um, even from a social distance. Um, so maybe there's an opportunity here to, to move in a social media ad campaign uh, so, something along those lines. Um, I don't know if that's been thought about or discussed, but maybe that might be a, a unique opportunity for us all. Yeah. Well, I, at the, and thank you, uh, Leader Gold, uh, for that. Um, we we do have we have begun. Um, we we have the the social media page and all of uh, our organizations that are within the collaborative promoted to their members. Our our uh, page likes have gone up. And again, all all of us on this uh, collaborative right now, we're all volunteers. We don't, they have their own businesses to worry about meeting their payroll. But uh, still, I, I think about uh, Stephanie at uh, Ballet Theater Company. She developed the website and it's beautiful. I can't wait till we can launch it. We have to get all eight people to agree <laughs> on on their particular contents, uh, but that should be in the next week or so. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's something we're working at. Uh, Ronnie has been very uh, helpful. She did a, a really nice piece about our uh, dilemma and what we've been doing. Um, you know, we've, we've shared, uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, the, the current, uh, we're trying to get them a little bit more involved, but uh, uh, it, or a little bit more interested in what we're doing, um, which is the challenge in, in this current climate. But I, I think that once we have uh, a commission established that could also lend a lot of uh, credence to our effort because because right now we want to be very careful. We are not what we're doing right now is not be on, on behalf of the town of West Hartford as a 
town commission or a town body. These are independent organizations. Uh, but, but I think once we have a, a and we're very careful to state that, that, that this is some, this is our efforts are not being directed by as a, as a commission under the town council. Um, once we can get the commission up and running, I think we bring a little bit more um, organization to it, uh, a little bit more um, legitimacy, really, in terms of, okay, this is something that the, the town council sees as very important. They've established a commission on arts and culture, and they have charged that commission with X, Y, and Z. You know, just like what we we saw in the past with uh, initiatives like uh, clean energy, or uh, you know, design review. I mean, it, there's these commissions a lot of times come out of uh, a need and a goal that the town and the town council, as as our elected representatives, has. So I think that uh, you know, once we can get our act together and get this, uh, and I talk about the collaborative because. Um, I'd like to be able to give you all some very good names uh, to consider because that's that's your that's your decision uh, on who to appoint to this uh, commission when that time does come. Uh, but I want to make sure that we have a good group uh, that's that's diverse, you know, not only you know gender-wise, uh, diverse backgrounds, diverse uh, areas of West Hartford, di diverse interests whether somebody might have a performance arts or a visual arts interest or be a parent of a child uh, that's uh, involved in the arts. I want to make sure uh, that we have a, um, a good, strong uh, list of candidates for you all to consider for that. Uh, thank you, Chuck. And, and uh, I think that, you know, we have weha.com, which is a very strong um, online presence in our community and uh, also our neighbors and friends. And they may be of assistance in terms of uh, uh, coordinating some type of marketing plan uh, going forward. And and I, I think, though, once we get through this entire crisis, that this is something that's permanent and here to stay because it, it's beneficial to, to all the entities involved. And uh, I think I, I can envision a brochure that you'll pick up quarterly saying, this is what's going on and you're gonna your head's going to spin because you're going to know what you could possibly fit in and during a week's time in to, to experience culture and arts in our community. So um, I, I think I think we were laying the groundwork and, and we're, we've got the, the right people in place, so, so thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions from my colleagues, so uh, we're gonna move on to the next item. And before we do that, uh, I've spoken to most of uh, uh, my colleagues who serve on this subcommittee, and I've asked that you think about uh, what particular areas uh, you would like to uh, be more involved in and, and take a lead on uh, as well to be like a council liaison uh, with respect to uh, the various things that we're discussing in this committee, whether it be tonight or, or, or a future meeting, because I, I think that uh, it's a really a lot for us to, to do collectively, but for one person to, to reach out to these various partners and to widen the, the net, so to speak, uh, to, to bring us uh, some some creative ideas going forward, I think, can only be beneficial. So if, if you find something that uh, excites you or, or you're interested in, let us know and, you know, go with it because uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen is is we fail. And um, the, the best thing that could happen is uh, we're successful and we're moving forward. So uh, this is the time to, to take a risk and, and to, to do those kinds of things. So um, with that said, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, and that's the uh, status of our outdoor dining and retail initiative that uh, we've, we've put into place. And um, if we could, uh, you know, just do like maybe 10 to 15, 10, 10 to 12 minutes on this item, because uh, it's basically a, a report as to where we're going and uh, if field any questions at that point, because I really want to get into um, uh, the economic development update, which would be after this, and uh, the uh, traffic calming initiative, which uh, includes uh, slow streets this evening. So uh, that that's a new item that we haven't really discussed before. So with that said, I'll shut up. And uh, Mr. Hart, I'll, I'll go to you next. 
Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Matt Hart, Town Manager. I'll just provide a quick overview, and I can turn to uh, Mr. McGovern and Mr. Pudlick to speak very quickly to the application process. So just to frame it a little bit uh, for those on, on the call, and the Council is well aware of this, as of May 20th, the governor's permitted outdoor dining and outdoor dining only. You know, we have a number of establishments in West Hartford, particularly in the center, Lubeck Square, and, and other parts of town that uh, had previously engaged in outdoor dining. We wanted to make sure that they could uh, maximize this opportunity. Uh, the mayor and other counselors challenged me. I, in turn, challenged the staff. You know, what more could we do? So. The plan that, that we prepared, and we did load it up uh, tonight in, in board docs for folks who would like to access it. We are putting more of the public right of way in, uh, in play. What do I mean by that? We are allowing our restaurants to apply to use sections of our sidewalks, um, on street parking spaces, sections of our streets, even small segments of some of our parking, uh, public parking lots. We presented the council with a plan a couple of weeks ago focused on the town center, a portion of LaSalle from the intersection of Arapahoe up to Farmington Avenue, a section of Farmington Avenue from that intersection with LaSalle moving to, uh, moving to the east to South Main Street, and then a very small section of South Main Street as well in the vicinity of Farmington Avenue. We had a, a Good call with a number of restaurateurs and retailers. I want to thank Ms. Gorski for organizing that. We received some feedback and we worked to incorporate that feedback. We added some additional on street parking spaces to LaSalle Road. And for a portion of Farmington, we added uh, some, uh, a few additional on street spaces as well as a, um, a loading area for delivery trucks. So the plan has not changed in a significant way since the council saw it last a couple weeks ago. Again, it is loaded online if you'd like to take a uh, harder look at it. We have ordered the infrastructure we'll need in order to implement the plan because we're going to have to protect these dining areas from vehicular traffic. That's going to be very important. And the town is covering that cost. We've, uh, we've ordered the equipment hoping to receive it uh, sometime next week and uh, begin begin installation in in early June. You know, we, we want to be able to set this design up to last for the this season, you know, whether that's through the end of October, maybe into early November. But we understand we're going to have to make a few tweaks to it based on based on experience. In the interest of time, uh, Deputy Mayor, why don't I stop there and I can ask Mr. McGovern and Mr. Public through you just to talk very quickly about the application process we've set up and the number of applications we've received. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. McGovern, good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Mark McGovern, uh, Community Development Director. Um, there have been a lot of different departments in, involved in this. Um, this effort, as you recall, the um, executive order required the special temporary permits for outdoor dining and retail to be approved within 10 days. Um, and this has involved uh, police, fire, health, EPW, and every division of community development. Um, there's one um, important distinction I want to make before I ask Brian to talk about the up-to-date data. Um, and that is um, we were only receiving applications for new dining areas or for existing dining areas that are going to be expanded in some way. Okay. So the, so the data that Brian's going to talk about are, are those applications. There are many restaurants who have outdoor dining permits who aren't changing the dimensions of them, um, and they did not have to apply to us. However, they would still need to follow the state guidance in terms of social distancing and table distancing. So some of the outdoor dining areas are staying just as they are um, with fewer tables within them. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Brian, who um, um, talk just a little bit about the processing and then what the current data is in terms of applications received and approved. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I, I appreciate that. Um, and thanks to um, Mr. Hart and Mr. Davidoff 
Uh, so just to kind of give a, a brief background on the on where we came from with the permitting process, so we we worked very very hard to uh, to establish a, a permitting program. That program went live on the 18th of May um, through a process uh, uh, through a seamless docs process or website. Um, unfortunately, over the first two days, uh, seamless docs wasn't entirely seamless, and we had a couple of uh, had a couple of challenges. Um, our, our IT staff helped us very quickly to resolve those, and, and we believe that it's working pretty well at this time. Um, so as Mark indicated, every application that, that we get in is reviewed by the Health District, the Department of Building Inspection, the Fire Marshal's Office, the Public Works Department, and finally my department, the Zoning Office. Um, to date, we've got a total of 28 applications. Actually, the recent number. Um, 17 of those came on the first day. Um, and so 17 of those came on, on May 19th. Um, we've approved a total of 10 um, applications. Four of those were in the center. Um, Bar Taco, Max Burger, Savoy, and Union Kitchen. Um, so mostly modest extensions of their existing outdoor dining areas. Outside of the center, we approved Blue Plate Kitchen, Butterfly, Effie's Place, the Fernwood, Gold Rock Diner, And the 10th approval is actually for uh, the retail store Be Kind in the center, which is the, the only retail store to apply through uh, through our system to to have sidewalk sales. Um, it looks like we're very close to approval on, on Brico and Song restaurants in the center. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get those ironed out in the next day or two. Um, seven of the initial 17 applicants were restaurants in the center that were looking to expand their current outdoor dining areas into the street with uh, uh, up to more than 50. Um, and those included Avert, Division West, Hartford Baking Company, Max Oyster Bar, Shish Kebab House, Treva, and Zohara. Um, at the time those applications were received, you know, they're, they're proposing dining in the street. We didn't have a program that was firmly in place at that point. Obviously the infrastructure was not in place to support on-street dining. Um, and so we notified each of those restaurants and suggested that if they wanted to move forward um, immediately that they could resubmit their application with a revised plan um, showing only sidewalk dining and, and we'd be happy to review that. Um, none of those actually took that opportunity. Um, and uh, in fact, we didn't hear from any of them after after that initial communication. And so, um, given given the the governor's mandated ten day clock to make a decision on these applications, we were actually um, forced to to send out rejection notices today. Um, but uh, you know, and, and and within that rejection notice, we were we encouraged every one of these restaurants. Restaurants to to reapply as soon as. The infrastructure is in place in the street, which we hope to have done, uh, you know, relatively relatively soon. Um, so those are those are the numbers that 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 we've got right now. I'm happy to have, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Public. Uh, some of your presentation was fading in and out, but I think uh, we could use our our, our best uh, judgment to to follow your feed uh, as to where you were going because you were, you know, going along methodically. So I think it was easy to understand. Um, I do have a question. So on the uh, places that were sent rejections, was there because it was a procedural matter that they need to get the rejections? Um, are they able to uh, reapply and um, and how long would it, an approval take? Would you use the materials that had already been approved to uh, speedily uh, assist them moving forward? Yes, uh, that, that that would be that, make sure I'm not, I'm not muted. Um, yes, that would be the idea. So we would we would ask them to reapply through the system uh, with a new application. They don't you're, you're totally fading out I'm set of plans sorry. provided the set of plans. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure if it's my internet connection or what's happening here. Um, it, that's sort of been happening all night with with everybody's presentation on my end and, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the idea would be that everybody could apply um uh, very quickly and, and hopefully we can we can get those applications processed 
So, so is it going to be, um, we're going to be doing the outreach from staff back to these applicants to uh, say, listen, why don't you try again? So we're going to take a, a proactive step instead of uh, waiting for them to, uh, to contact us again. Is that going to be our approach? That that would be our approach. Yeah, we're gonna we'll keep in in active communication with the restaurants that have expressed interest in on street dining and make sure that they're aware of uh, of when they can apply. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your efforts. Any of my colleagues have any questions or comments with respect to uh, the outdoor dining and retail initiative uh, to date? Uh, Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Just a quick question on the partial street closures. I know that uh, LaSalle uh, creates, in the center there, creates some special opportunities. And hopefully we'll start to have dine-in in the June 20th timeframe. But I want to know if the town was looking at partial street closures for any of the other uh, commerce areas in town. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. M Mr. Hart. Yep, thank you, Deputy Mayor, Matt Hart, Town Manager. Um, thank you, Councilor Williams, for your question. In terms of the, the street closure, we're technically we're not closing any of the streets. We're intentionally intentionally keeping uh, keeping them open. Um, that section of LaSalle, we did reduce, as you know, to uh, to one way traffic, uh, northbound only, just through that very short section. And on Farmington Avenue, we collapsed four lanes down to two one travel lane in each direction. We are looking at working on a concept right now for Blueback Square in which we would allow them, certain restaurants in Blueback Square, to utilize more of the sidewalk, a couple of parking spaces, et cetera. That plan may require us to reconfigure a few of their interior streets to one-way traffic. And uh, we're working on that in consultation with uh, Starwood, you know, the company that currently manages Blueback Square as well as um, their uh, their tenant restaurants. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Williams. Do you have anything further? Yeah. So, uh, what about um, areas like Park Road? Is there concerns about uh, the traffic there? And have we looked at that, huh? Mr. Hart. Yeah, we would we would certainly entertain an expression of interest uh, from from those areas. Um, you know, the center, and, and Mr. McGovern could comment on this better than I, the center with its configuration, the way the on-street parking spaces are configured, um, and the way Blueback Square is designed are more appropriate for utilizing right away actually in the road. But, you know, we could certainly consider options for Park Road and, uh, and Elmwood. And then recall, when we talked about this initially, there is a large number of our restaurants that are located purely on private property, whether it's in Corbin's Corner, Bishop's Corner, what have you. If uh, restaurants in those areas can obtain permission from their property owner to utilize more of uh, the common areas in those shopping plazas, we would certainly consider applications um, for those locations too. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Anything further, Mr. Williams? No, thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Davo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to let you know, Mohammed and Ben, if you want to like jump off the call, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but you know, if you want to continue to to uh, listen in and hear all the great things that we're doing in our community, you're more than welcome to stay on. Uh, Mr. Winograd, you had a uh, question or a comment? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, question regarding um, also LaSalle Road. Um, currently, the uh, uh, pickup patrons and retail patrons have had the the half hour free parking, um, efficient way to kind of come in and come out. Um, is that being maintained? Um, more importantly, can prohibit long-term parking on those now fewer spots. Um, concerned that restaurant patrons would be parking they're near where they're eating, but, but then taking up those spots for, for a longer period of time and making it harder for people to do the, the run in uh, type parking and the retail uh, visits. Mr. Hart. Uh, Matt Hart, Town Manager. Thank you, Councilor Winograd, for that question. Yes, that is our intent. Uh, we, 
we will keep that that was a key factor in the design we want to keep a number of on-street parking spaces available for um, uh, for uh, takeout and other quick visits to those local retailers we're going to need to monitor it carefully though as you know from uh, an enforcement perspective because if people start camping out in those spaces for long periods of time that's going to be counterproductive and that that'll be a problem we need to uh, we need to address but we plan to keep those those spaces in place at, at least for this season um, we are seeing some increased demand uh, fortunately now in our, our public private uh, our public parking lots uh, which is which is beneficial to the larger operation thank you mr. Hart anything further mr. Winograd? Uh, yes, thank you. And despite um, I'm I'm sure the effectiveness of Mayor Cantor's uh, own messages, but maybe not everybody listens or to our health director. Um, the masks in the center are still um, a problem, um, and and certainly may pick up as people are eating and dining outside in in the streets. Um, is there a plan for signage to remind? people to wear their mask uh, when they're um, in those areas. Mr. Hart. Matt Hart, town manager. Uh, yes, Councilor Winograd. So we, we are working now on designs for physical signs that we would post primarily in the greater center area. So our, our communications team is working on that now. I saw a couple of examples today. And we would work with Public Works to uh, to erect them. We're going to continue to met our messaging campaign, and then with respect to enforcement, it's a combined effort between the police department, um, zoning, and the health district. The health district is responsible primarily for food establishments, and uh, the zoning office will handle the other retailers. But they're going to work as a team. So maybe I can just ask. Uh, Mr. Public to briefly talk about um, our planned enforcement activities, uh, what we're doing now, what we're planning to do over the next couple of weeks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. Public. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. David Hoff, Mr. Hart. Um, the the intent would be, well, at this point, we, we have not begun any enforcement proceedings against any establishment um, as, as this process is just sort of getting up and going. Um, our intent as we move forward in the next in the in the coming weeks would be to uh, uh, we will we will, but uh, essentially upon complaint um, and and those complaints whether they come into my department directly or into the PD or health department um, we will uh, make sure that the that the restaurants the individual restaurants are notified um, within within the next day um, of the issue and, and uh, to ask what steps they're going to take to, to correct it to ensure their customers are doing the right thing. Um, we're going to obviously work with them. We're going to try not to be punitive, but uh, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to work as hard as we can to ensure that the, uh, that the rules are being met. Uh, thank you, Mr. Public. Uh, we, we, so we got about 75% of your, your commentary, but I, I'm very sorry about that. I That's really okay. am. We figured it out. These are unique times, so uh, <laughs> we're, we're a smart bunch of people. We, we figured it out. I, I would like to suggest, and this is just an idea that I just had while we're thinking about this, that with respect to uh, Councilman uh, Winograd's suggestion about signage, we have that banner right now that's thanking our uh, our first responders and our everyday heroes. Perhaps a banner we could get uh, uh, could say something that uh, the mayor has said in all her Everbridge messages is I wear a face covering to protect you and your face covering protects me with uh, some type of graphic and 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 hang that on on the center green I I, I think I think that uh, is widely seen uh, it, it promotes uh, the message that we are, are trying to project and not only should it be in the center but it, there are other places in town that we could probably uh, remind people in a friendly manner that uh, going forward, uh, face coverings are, are, are the socially responsible thing to do. And uh, it, it's been uh, advocated uh, from the CDC in terms of their guidelines. And uh, we're all in this together. And 
I, I think, you know, it's very similar to the, the things we see on the highway when the state of Connecticut uh, does the, uh, you know, click it or ticket uh, uh, campaign we see on the overhead uh, uh, signs there. So perhaps in, in our in our business districts, we could we could we could put up these these types of banners. I think it's it's proactive. It's it's not something that we would expect our our uh, restaurant community to, to undertake on their own. But I think that's something as the as the government uh, we we could we could take take that on to uh, to spread that message and uh, uh, come up with a, a nice looking graphic uh, to to accompany it. Uh, whether and it, and it could even be in our business districts. It could even be the the uh, particular logo for the districts. Uh, you know asking for for that kind of uh, social responsibility uh, commitment uh, whether it be in on park road the design district corbin's corner bishop's corner the center blueback and um, i i think that would be would be helpful so just, i just offer that up as, as a thought but it, it can't hurt i think thank you for the thumbs up mr hart anyone further on uh, the uh, this topic about our our opening and where we are uh, today I think uh, we got a pretty good update as to when the um, the barriers are going to be uh, put in place. Uh, we're going to try to make them as attractive as possible. You know, we're going to try to keep uh, vehicular traffic away from uh, pedestrians, keep keep the diners safe, uh, allow our business community retailers to uh, not uh, be marginalized by uh, the effect that the diners are on the street. And uh, we're asking for cooperation from our residents that. Uh, Listen, if you want to do a curbside pickup, uh, please limit your, your time in, in the parking spaces uh, to 30 minutes so that uh, others can use them. And and these are small asks and to wear the face covering. They're small asks, and I'm certain as a community we can accomplish all these things so that at the end of the day, our restaurants, are, our business community are winners, and our patrons and our customers are winners too. So it's a win, 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 win all around. Uh, with that said, uh, we'll go next to uh, economic development. Uh, Mr. Hart, do you want to kick it off for the update? I do. I do. Matt Hart, town manager. Thank you, deputy mayor. So I think as, as the council is aware and our guest as well, um, economic development is, is a multifaceted discipline. And we, we focus a lot of attention, understandably, on business recruitment. You know, who are, who are we working to, to bring into town? Um, how are we going to seek to grow the grand list? And as the council knows, I've been working with the team and, and uh, taking lead on some of our larger, larger uh, business recruitment uh, grand list growth type initiatives. But tonight, we're going to talk about another very important facet of economic development. And that is more along the lines of business retention now, how do we how do we um, how do we allow our existing businesses how do we help them survive during a very difficult and challenging period for many of them and Ms. Ms. Gorski largely you know working with some of her colleagues um, has done a lot of uh, a lot of good work we heard earlier tonight of some of the partnerships um, with, with our workforce collaborative, but she's done a lot of very good work to support our businesses during the pandemic. And that's what we'd like to talk to you about tonight. You know, those efforts, uh, she can provide an overview. Uh, we can take your questions as well as your ideas. So through you, Deputy Mayor, I'd like to call on Ms. Gorski. Ms. Gorski. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Gorski, Economic Development Specialist. Um, so as Matt said, um, you know, I'm going to provide you some insights in terms of uh, what I've been doing to support the business community throughout this whole entire COVID um, time period. Um, it has been a incredibly busy time for me, as, as all you can assume. Um, you know, in West Hartford, we have well over 2,000 businesses. Um, so that's, you know, they range from solo entrepreneurs, a, a one-person shop, up to 750 uh, employees to a manufacturer. So uh, it really runs the gamut in terms of how many people really all of this has affected, um, you know, both at the business uh, level as well as the employee level. 
So a couple of the, you know, the things right off the bat, you know, I, I think the goal has always been to reach as many people as possible throughout this whole entire process. So throughout uh, COVID, um, we have consistently been uh, communicating with, uh, you know, up, up at this point, you know, it had been pretty consistent at about 900 uh, business and property owner representatives uh, at this point. You know, we're we're probably well over 1,200 um, in terms of our consistent communications. What do those communications look like? Um, it is providing our businesses as well as um, again property managers, property owners with valuable information, up to date information on things that will hopefully help sustain our businesses and keep them here. So um, it's been providing uh, different items such as state, uh, federal, private financial programs that are available um, specifically specifically the Paycheck Protection Program, the state's bridge loan, um, you know, the economic injury uh, loans and grants through the Small Business Administration, um, HEDCO, minority and women-owned business um, opportunities, as well as a wide variety of other uh, private um, in, uh, institution grants and loan opportunities. Um, in addition to that, um, it's not just been communicating those items and what those programs look like. It's also been giving updates as those programs change, how, uh, you know, how those certain changes might affect uh, business owners, depending upon what industry they're in, depending upon, you know, any uh, individual nuances or challenges. Um, in addition, it is uh, working very consistently on both a, a larger basis um, through uh, different groups, such as the business associations, some uh, um, through the Chamber of Commerce, as well as on a very um, individual basis. Um, so, you know, when I talk about uh, working with the business community and sending them communications, I would say for every communication that I send, you know, it's well worth it when you're receiving anywhere from, you know, 20 to 100 responses based on what you send. And a lot of that is, you know, anywhere from just better uh, helping for our business owners or property managers, owners, to better understand any of these programs, um, you know, right down to not a not just a high level overview, um, but right down to you know people who can't figure out how to physically uh, um, complete an application and who are having challenges. Um, so you know, it's it's kind of really run uh, again run the gamut in terms of uh, the support as it pertains to those programs, um, and then also really just understanding the core needs of these businesses. So you know, again, we have such a wide range of businesses as well as nonprofits in West Hartford. Everybody has a, a unique individual need and working with them to figure out how we can give them the best solution. Um, and, you know, and, and many people, again, it's a it's a struggle from a financial perspective for them throughout this process. So, you know, people who are struggling to um, and, and think that they can't apply for some sort of financial program, uh, specifically the PPP program, because they can't afford a, a CPA or attorney to be able to help uh, uh, put together the application for them. So being able to advise our businesses on all of the free business advising services that are out there to be able to help them complete those applications and working very closely with those partner organizations um, on those, uh, those individual business needs. So those uh, particular partner organizations um, who have been so great throughout this process the Connecticut Small Business Development Center, the University of Hartford's Entrepreneurial Center, uh, the Wis uh, Women's Business Development Council, uh, you know, Department of Labor. We heard from uh, Capital Workforce Partners, um, you know, and it's it's really actually inter interesting uh, to think about this. You know, while we talk about most people have been uh, truly hurt by this pandemic, um, it's it's interesting to think about. You know, I had sent uh, pretty early on a referral over to my colleagues. Um, you know, at, at, at Ben at American uh, job center for one of our manufacturers who actually needed to hire. Um, so you know, it's 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 different um, different needs for everybody. And and when you're in a pandemic and uh, you have employees who can't show up to work, or you ha actually have an influx in terms of your business, and you need to figure out you know successful ways to get the that product out the door. Um, we have seen several of our larger again manufacturers, distributors, kind of in a in a um, an uptick hiring phase. Um, so that's a little bit different from working with the the people who are really experiencing um, extreme financial challenges, but it's still a challenge. Um, and so. 
In addition to that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I've been working on for the last couple of weeks that has been really great in terms of being able to uh, connect with even more of our business owners um, is uh, working with uh, my colleagues, Bob McHugh, as well as uh, Jared Smith on the uh, free mask program uh, through CBIA. Um, so uh, essential businesses uh, can request um, uh, masks through the CBIA and they are free. You can get up to two per employee uh, for uh, employers who have up to 50 employees. Um, many people have utilized that. So that program is probably about four weeks old. Um, and to date, uh, we have serviced 250 businesses in town. And then we are going into the second week of the thermometer program as well. So that is for infrared thermometers. Those are free um, and were announced um, uh, less than two weeks ago. Um, and so to date, in, in less than two weeks, we've already um, received uh, uh, 160 requests. And so that is for businesses, for-profit businesses, nonprofits, as well as our houses of worship. So all of those requests are still coming in. Both of those programs are still open and operating. Um, in addition to that, uh, many of our businesses are having uh, continued challenges. Uh, accessing extra PPE, um, including, uh, you know, uh, other, t uh, so the mask program is for essential businesses. So what about the non-essential businesses? They obviously met, need masks for them as well as their employees, um, hand sanitizer, sanitizing wipes, uh, you know, a wide variety of different items that people are having challenges and difficulty accessing. So it's working with those businesses to know what they're looking for and either on an individual or group basis, figure out what vendors um, are, are, are good vendors that they can work with that are both, you know, FDA, CDC approved items um, and be able to, uh, you know, facilitate connections with those vendors so that our businesses can get what they need. Um, and a really good example is nobody can find uh, sanitizing wipes anywhere. So I finally it was able to um, get in contact with a local um, vendor who, uh, you know, her, her supply ship out of California. I had a list of seven different businesses who had vocalized that's what they needed. I sent out a list with the specifications and multiple people ended up ordering off that list. Uh, in particular, it was interesting. We had a, a business, uh, a, um, a construction related business with five employees who ended up, you know, splitting an order and going in collaboratively on a procurement uh, for wipes with one of our large scale 500 plus employee manufacturers um, because in order to meet the minimum order, um, that's, that's how it was able to shake out. So facilitating additional connections um, throughout the business community, community again with each other, um, as well as with for PPE and making sure that um, all of our businesses have what they need. Um, in addition, uh, it has been the last uh, couple of weeks and the, you know, the next uh, month or so, um, or, or really a couple of months, it also has been working on business reopening. So I think for quite some time it was, uh, you know, figuring out who was essential, who, uh, you know, wanted to remain open but wasn't deemed essential, how they go through a process at DECD to become deemed essential if they wanted to remain open, um, and really trying to figure out ways to sustain business within a lot of these restrictions that were put on um, these businesses and, and nonprofits. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that it has been trying to communicate as best as possible the reopening plan how it affects different industries, different sectors, what they uh, need to comply with in order to be open, uh, specifically the self-certification program, different health and safety guidelines, um, as well as working through different challenges for specific, uh, you know, nuanced or, or really unique industries and businesses and, and where they kind of fall in, in line in terms of the reopening. Um, and and really just working with everybody to understand um, you know how they how they can be legally up and running and operational what they can anticipate um, also kind of working to communicate a lot of the challenges or, or really um, concerns about some of these reopening uh, um, to uh, people such as and and this kind of brings me into my next thing um, we 
have also, in uh, collaboration with the Chamber, held a number of small business forums. So uh, first we had kind of at a, a federal state, higher state level, a Senator Blumenthal. Um, and then uh, the week before last, we had DECD Commissioner Lehman. Uh, on deck next week, we'll have Mayor Cantor. So we kind of hit, you know, the federal, uh, state, and local level. And so it's giving these businesses a platform to be able to communicate any of the ongoing uh, concerns concerns or you know issues where they really feel like haven't been uh, haven't been either um, resolved or addressed through um, any sort of uh, you know federal state programs or legislation executive orders so on and so forth um, lastly I think the the thing that I want to touch upon um, is uh, and before I kind of go into this um, a, a lot of what I do uh, or have been doing rather through this pandemic has been working very um, closely with our incredible partners at the chamber. Um, you know, we have been doing so much together and, and really as a <clears throat> as a department of one, um, you know, the, the volume with trying to help our business community, they have really been an extension of me and we're so, we are so lucky to be able to have them. Uh, that staff has just done a phenomenal job. They don't say no to anything. Uh, they're always willing to help uh, no matter what time it is, uh, what day it is. So uh, kudos to them. And I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled to be able to work with them. Um, so, you know, those small business forums that we've been doing have been in partnership with the chamber, as well as we uh, consistently have, um, and some of, some of you have heard this before, but we've consistently held weekly phone calls throughout the whole entire pandemic with representatives from each of our business districts. And that has been a really strong platform for uh, our businesses. Uh, and again, there's a couple of property managers on there as well. So, you know, we, we hit at kind of a broader level when we have them involved. Um, but, you know, it's been a really great platform for people to share um, a lot of concerns that we, we work through, um, best practices, a lot of really great um, ideas. And, and we will not, um, you know, even after, you know, the, the COVID um, pandemic, uh, you know, is once we're on the other side, those, those won't stop. Um, so everybody has vocalized how valuable that has been because, you know, as we know, every single commercial district that we have in town is so uniquely different. Um, but, you know, it's been it's been really interesting to hear from the different industries in the different areas of town, um, you know, similarities, differences in, in terms of what they're experiencing and, and help kind of work through any of uh, the items that are on their list. Um, so I, I think that that is a, a pretty uh, good summary of a lot that I've been working on. I'm sure I'm missing something, but I've, I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Korsky. That was a lot of information in, in that uh, period of time. The only thing that I would suggest is that uh, some of these PPP uh, loans are going to uh, come to the period of time now where uh, the businesses will have a short window to ask for loan forgiveness and if we could uh, either develop some type of webinar or, um, you know, cheat sheet to uh, assist these businesses uh, to meet that uh, deadline. Otherwise, they're going to be looking at a uh, 1% loan over two years for uh, large amounts of money in some cases. But if they uh, miss this window of forgiveness, um, it's, uh, it could be partly because they, didn't, they don't really understand uh, the necessity to meet that deadline, or you know, they uh, don't have uh, the financial needs to reach out to an accountant or an attorney. So that I know, I've talked to some business owners, and they're they're like, well, how do I get the forgiveness? So that that would be the the next thing I think, because some of them are are going to be past that 56 day window coming soon. Uh, that's that's one suggestion. I know some of my colleagues may have a, a question or two before we go any further. Is um, I see. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Blanks. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you. Uh, wow, Christian, that was a bang up report. Thank you for that. I mean, that was packed with so much um, great information. And you may have already touched upon this uh, in the past, but in terms of the infrared, infrared thermometers that are made available to the businesses, how are those distributed and um, how do businesses know, I guess, how to receive them? Uh, Ms. Korsky. 
Thank you. Um, great question. So that is a newer program. It was established the Friday before last. Um, so we we sent out an e blast, um, or I, I did rather, um, to about 1,200 plus. Um, really, it's closer to 13, including our houses of worship um, uh, representatives and businesses throughout town. Um, in addition, we've tried to uh, work through some of our social media channels to promote that as well. Um, so there are different ways for each uh, category of um, classification of business, whether you're a for-profit, non-profit, or a house of worship, there are different ways for you to be able to apply. Um, so for the non-profits and the for-profit businesses, it is the same as the free mask program. So that is directly through um, the CBIA website. Um, and then there is actually a, um, a different form that needs to be filled out for the houses of worship um, that gets submitted directly to um, CBIA and CONSTEP um, at the state level. And then once all of those um, uh, requests are submitted, it's collected, it's submitted directly to the state, collected by the state. Um, and then on uh, on Tuesday of each week, we've been receiving an updated um, spreadsheet list of everybody who has submitted um, requests for either masks or infrared thermometers. Um, and then we send out uh, an e-blast notification to everybody who's on that list. And then on Thursdays, all of those items have been distributed um, at Cedric Middle School, um, and typically that's from 10 a.m. to noon. Um, so, you know, huge thank you to Bob McHugh, as well as Jared Smith from the fire department and many members of our health district um, who have been uh, specifically helping to run that program as well. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Anything further, Ms. Spines? No, no thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you, Christian. Uh, so as a small business retailer, I did uh, go through the CBIA, uh, CBIA uh, website and did uh, procure one of those infrared uh, thermometers for my small business. Uh, to my dismay, it was not manufactured in the good old USA, though. And uh, that was that was a little disappointing. But uh, it does work, but uh, it would have been nice if it was made in, in America. Uh, that That's my little country. I know that Mr. Gold has a question, but I do want to go to Mr. Hart. Um, Mr. Hart. Uh, can you give us uh, a brief update as to your role um, as the uh, uh, the lead on economic development as it affects our uh, grand list development uh, during this this fiscal year? Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor Matt Hart, Town Manager. I could just uh, I'll speak to that uh, generally. Uh, um, we do have some number of economic development initiatives underway. You know, I think many of them are going to prove to be very, very positive for the town. Uh, many of them are in their infancy stages, and it wouldn't be appropriate to, uh, to discuss them in public session at this point in time. Um, I, I have become um, more involved over time in, in those major initiatives, you know, working collaboratively with uh, Ms. Gorski, with Mr. McGovern, with Mr. DeMay, and, uh, and others. So, you know, we're working as a team, uh, setting, setting some good direction as to how we can grow our grand list in a sustainable way, in a way that uh, comports with our plan of, of conservation and development, but also, you know, how can we best capitalize um, best capitalize on uh, existing economic conditions where does it make sense for the town to make a strategic investment as properties become available as key parcels become available in town you know whether it's a nonprofit institution that's putting it up for sale or a private entity uh, what role can the town play um, in terms of finding a uh, a new developer? Might it make sense uh, to structure a public-private partnership for a key parcel like that? So there are uh, a handful of, of key initiatives that I think are going to prove very promising for the town over the next couple of years. Um, I am personally very, very involved in those, taking a lead on those, again, working with Mr. McGovern, 
Ms. Gorski, Mr. DeMay, and others. So I hope that that helps. I know that was somewhat general. Happy to take any questions on that. Also happy to talk to counselors uh, offline on that topic too. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Uh, Mr. Gold. Thank you. I just had a quick question follow up with, for Kristen uh, through you, uh, Leon. Um, you talk, we were talking about business retention and all, all of those facets. Is there a number that we have of businesses that haven't survived through this pandemic that you know of? Uh, and I hate to be uh, you know, a downer on that, but I, I do want to, I, I'm interested to know if any businesses have not come through so far and what has been done to try to help float those businesses through even though they didn't make it. And what can we learn from that if that happened? Uh, thank you, Mr. Gold. Uh, Ms. Korski. Um, great question. Uh, in terms of data, I would say, no, we don't have that. I am I am knocking on wood as I'm saying this. Um, you know, the only business uh, that really comes to mind that we really know um, did, did not survive um, is Brio over at the West Farms Mall. Um, and I, it, it's a national chain and it wasn't necessarily COVID related. Um, so, you know, in terms of the literally hundreds of businesses that I've been working with, um, again, knock wood, fingers crossed, everything, um, you know, every everybody is in a, a decent shape right now. Anything further, Mr. Gold? No, thank you. Any uh, questions for the manager about um, economic development, ground list growth uh, that you'd want to know in, in a public setting? Uh, Mayor Cantor. I, I just want to say a quick thank you. Uh, I, I know Kristen has been working tirelessly and there's a lot coming uh, at, and it's unpredictable. So um, as, but as things, uh, the outreach, uh, I think we're hitting a, again, a, a little sliver of, of, of some stability potentially um, that we continue to be strategic and, and bringing, you know, helping obviously businesses here, but also um, businesses that want to be here and being really in tune with that because uh, it's going to be a very competitive environment <laughs> uh, for businesses. Um, and we want to make sure that we, we are, we're, we do that. Um, and then, uh, Matt, I, I appreciate it. We, we need you um, as, as the leader. Everybody that's going to invest significant money uh, needs to have that voice. So I appreciate the the, out, the forward um, charge. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cantor. I would uh, sort of echo what uh, the mayor said, that uh, we're going to see some people who will suffer misfortunes as a result of uh, of this uh, crisis, uh, they won't have the uh, financing or the financial uh, stability to, to make it through it. And um, while, while that, that is a reality uh, to, to a lot, and especially in, in the retail sector, uh, I think we, we, we definitely need to be prepared for that. Uh, with that said, I do think that uh, there will be opportunities for those who want to get into the West Hartford market who have been precluded uh, from obtaining that space, so to speak, that they've uh, wanted to occupy, occupy in, in town uh, to, to do their business going forward. So there's, there's a lot of uh, different players, which basically uh, brings me back to something I mentioned uh, many, many months ago, where I think we always need to be on the offensive to uh, continue to sell our community and its strengths and why uh, West Hartford is the place that you would want to locate your business to. Uh, a lot of communities are going to be in the uh, same um, mindset that we are. Uh, they're going to experience it and they're going to be out there selling their communities uh, to people looking uh, to relocate to where it makes sense and where they have the greatest opportunity uh, to uh, succeed and uh, uh, prosper. So uh, I'm certain that uh, we'll take those necessary steps to make certain that uh, we're successful in that endeavor. Uh, is there anyone else on the, on the council that wishes to ask a question or offer a comment at this point? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, the next item, which deals with traffic calming and initiative to include uh, slow streets. So I'll go to Mr. Hart. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, Matt Hart, Town Manager. I'll start off and then I will ask Mr. McGovern to elaborate on, on my comments. So a, a couple of things here. 
as the council is is aware you know for some time now and at the mayor's initiative at other council members initiative we've been looking at the concept of uh, pedestrian streets so what is what does that mean you know it can take a couple of variations uh, one is closing a section of a street to vehicular traffic and converting it to pedestrian use only. And, you know, there are some examples around the region, uh, nationally and, and internationally. And we were, uh, we were working on that initiative and actually had built in some monies uh, in, in the proposed budget for next fiscal year to do some work in the center um, along LaSalle, along Farmington, not necessarily to close the street entirely, but to put more of it in pedestrian use. Uh, similarly, we had some uh, ideas and concepts in mind for, for Isham and Memorial for Blueback Square. So COVID-19 has impacted our plans a little bit, but as you can see, with uh, outdoor dining and retail, we are able to accomplish that, or some of that. So that, that's pedestrian streets. Uh, we also, our engineering department, and Mr. McGovern will elaborate on this in, in a little bit, has been working on a traffic calming initiative for a little while now too and how how what what type of traffic calming mechanisms would work best for a dense suburb like west hartford you know with with a grid uh, many communities for example will utilize uh, speed humps and tools like that are those appropriate for west hartford you know maybe only in certain areas uh, there are other traffic calming devices that can be utilized as well. And then more recently, you know, we've been talking uh, about the concept of slow streets. That's something the mayor and I have spent a little time on. What's a slow street? Particularly with, with the advent of COVID-19, it's a mechanism that some cities and areas around the country are utilizing in order to slow slow vehicular traffic to slow it down so that a, a portion of a street particularly in more of a residential neighborhood can be utilized for other purposes for pedestrian purposes uh, for walking for cycling um, for play areas you know why is that so important in a time like this well with COVID-19 we're limited, right? We're limited with respect to, uh, to travel. We're limited with respect to recreational and exercise opportunities. We're more homebound. We're encouraged to get outside. We're encouraged to get outside, do things outside, because um, it's good for us. Good, healthy outlets, uh, walking, running, cycling, our kids utilizing, playing in, in the street where it's safe to do so. So some communities um, have been successful with this type of initiative. Uh, locally, some of the best examples I would point to are in the greater Boston area, uh, such as Arlington would be one example. I have asked Mr. McGovern to work with our engineering staff to identify some opportunities for West Hartford uh, to do that in a relatively expeditious manner so that we can bring it to you and look at some pilots for our community. So I'd like to pause there, if I could, Deputy Mayor and ask Mr. McGovern to elaborate on my comments. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Mark McGovern, Community Development Director. Um, when Matt uh, informed me that the committee was interested in discussing slow streets, um, my reaction was it's completely consistent with our traffic calming uh, programming that we're working on for some time now. Um, our engineering division has been doing a lot of research and putting together a draft program, which we hope to present to the council um, at the end of the calendar year. Um, probably the number one complaint we get in town is uh, speeding. And the number one request we get here is to add a stop sign to stop speeding, um, which isn't the right device to stop speeding. But uh, that's all you know. said um, to illustrate the fact that a lot of traffic uh, studies um, around speed in particular in our neighborhood streets uh, over the last several years, which got us to the point where we need to develop a program um, that would be sort of grassroots based come from uh, neighborhoods that have support in neighborhoods for different traffic uh, calming uh, devices. Uh, Matt mentioned several of them. 
So uh, we've met and spent a lot of time with police, fire, the Board of Ed Transportation, also worked with uh, UConn's Technology Transfer Center. Um, and we have a draft map identifying streets that uh, may be eligible for traffic calming. Traffic calming could include things like uh, diverters, roundabouts um, on sort of a larger, more expensive end down to signage and pavement markings and, and things of that nature. So it all, it all depends. But what's what's key is buy-in from the from the yeah, from the neighborhood. So we're looking at this the way we do our, our sidewalk policy. If residents come to us and say you know, they'd like a sidewalk installed because there's not one, we we need to generate um, sufficient support in the neighborhood for it um, because it's it's going to it's going to change things. So um, our goal is to um, have a, a program that would um, kind of lay out the streets that would be eligible. Uh, that way, residents could come forward and we could evaluate if, number one, if there is a problem, and number two, how the problem could be um, addressed through one of these different measures. Um, and we hope to have that to the council uh, later this year. Um, as it relates to slow streets, um, I think we have a head start by having, having a map of eligible streets already. So I think in short order, we can identify some streets that, that make sense because we've done a lot of the homework already. And uh, we could have some recommendations for you as well. I certainly think that the uh, the movement towards uh, slow streets um, as a result of this pandemic is is something that could um, be implemented quickly and uh, and effectively. So I'd be happy to uh, work on that with all of you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGovern. Uh, Mayor Cantor. So I have a question. Is the so identifying that a street is going to be um, a, a good candidate for a speed table or a, a curb or some kind of engineering to help to slow traffic? It, it, that is not the the slow street you're talking about, right? Those are two different things. Well. We don't identify, we're not identifying streets to determine what to put there. We're identifying streets that could be candidates from the point of view of um, being eligible because an ineligible street might be one that is really important for buses or police or fire in our routes that would make that street um, sort of ineligible for a speed hump or chicanes or a semi-diverter. So it's almost, as if um, we're developing a classification of streets that could accommodate um, these types of installations. So how do those work with bicycles and, uh, you know, pedestrians too a little bit? I know that we, we've, we've done some things that then come back as a, that yeah, they, they, they focused on slowing traffic, but they really didn't think necessarily about, surely and not about bicycles. Maybe pedestrians, but um, but not maybe in a a more um, expansive way. Um, Mayor, I think it's an issue where we have to take it on a case by case basis and apply our complete streets policy. Um, and the pedestrian issues and the bicycle issues are going to vary from one neighborhood to another. Um, but those are the, exactly the sort of issues that we would look at with each neighborhood that comes forward interested in doing traffic calming. Uh, that, that I, I, you know, I, I feel like traffic calming is one important issue. And I, I mentioned this to town manager. I, I view that as a car centric look, even though it, it, it is about the safety of everybody, no question. Um, and that is the biggest complaint we get. Absolutely. Well, it used to be. <laughs> now it's different complaint, but um, but uh, from the uh, from the the models now that are popping up around the country and the world, um, and people focusing on living outside, that to me is a is a might be you know a helpful exercise that you've gone through. But I I, I see that as a, a maybe you can. Uh, get there quicker because of the work that you've done. I, I think that's what you said. I'm not sure, but um, but that to me is a, a a unique initiative. I think from from what we're. So I just I I don't know if if that. I, I agree, Mayor. That it's it's a different issue. I think 
I think it's related, and I think the work, and yes, I was trying to convey that the work we've done so far on the traffic calming will help us with slow streets. Mr. Hart? Well, that was the, that was the point I just wanted to make. Um, again, the work we've done on the traffic calming initiative on related initiatives, that has put us in a good position to identify candidates for the, uh, the slow street activities so that we'll be able to move forward on that in a more expeditious way. All right, so maybe someone can clarify some confusion I'm having. So this slow street initiative, how is that going to um, help with um, economic recovery? How is that gonna position our business districts uh, in a better position? How's that gonna help them with respect to the consumer, the users, the customers, uh, the business owners? How, do, how, does, how does this benefit? Mr. Hart? Yeah, Matt Hart, town manager. I, I can take a stab at it, Deputy Mayor. I mean, arguably, we could we could have brought this issue to the other recovery committee as well. Um, the, the Slow Street Initiative, I think, would enhance would enhance the desirability, help enhance the desirability of our community um, as as a great place to uh, to live. You know, we're nationally recognized. We know that we're always looking to get better. Uh, I think an initiative like that would would uh, would assist in that regard. Um, is there a direct connection to business? You know, I think it depends on, on where we do this. Now, pedestrian streets, that certainly, you can see a very co strong connection to businesses. And uh, there are many studies out there that show when streets are converted to pedestrian use only, the businesses in, in that, uh, on that street um, benefit significantly. The, stro the slow street concept is something a little bit different. What we are looking at right now are rolling that out, particularly in uh, residential areas, areas with a uh, higher level um, of residential density, if you will, areas with smaller lot sizes, areas along the grid, et cetera, um, based again on the road classification work we've done to date. But in terms of that direct connection to business and economic development, what I see is that initiative would only enhance the desirability of our community. Thank you, Mr. Hart. There was a mention that Arlington, Massachusetts, or was it Arlington, Virginia, uh, had undertaken this initiative? And if so, do you think you could get us some supporting documentation to give examples of what it was before and what it was after? And and what was the, the benefit uh, and the community reaction before we go down this path? Mr. Hart. Yeah, Matt Hart, town manager. Let me start, and I see Mr. McGovern raised his hand too. Uh, I was referring to Arlington, Mass. Um, I know uh, the, the uh, town manager there. He's a great colleague of, of mine. Um, certainly we can obtain uh, some good data from them and i know mr mcgovern has done some research as well and i would ask him through you to to elaborate on my response mr mcgovern sure park mcgovern community development director um all of this is very new so the research that you know i've done just this week is spent some web information on different municipalities they get started um on the west coast first uh, oakland and san francisco kind of earlier and on the East Coast, and certainly the Boston area has a number of communities. Um, I don't think they're far enough along in, in these slow streets to have data um, to report yet. We could certainly look into that. Um, some of these installations are discussed as being temporary um, and have only been in place for a couple of weeks in some cases. And I think my understanding is that in most cases, as it relates to doing this, um specific to the pandemic is that these are temporary measures that they're going to evaluate to determine whether or not you would make them permanent in the future thank you for the answer mr mcgowan appreciate it uh ms blanks i think had a question yes thank you through you deputy mayor thank you for that um mr mcgovern and mr hart because that's what i was going to ask were there other communities 
besides Arlington Mass that were uh, either demonstrating or have these initiatives? Because I would be uh, interested in uh, learning more about it. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Vice. Mr. Hart? Matt Hart, Town Manager. Uh, yes, Councilor Blanks, you know, there, there are a hint, as Mr. McGovern was talking about. Um, there are some communities in the greater Boston area. Uh, Arlington is, is uh, one that we've already mentioned. But this initiative, at least in the U.S., appears to have started in the greater Bay, Bay Area. Uh, so there are some examples there. Um, I think New York City is doing some of this work now, too. But there are some number of jurisdictions nationally that are engaged in this. Uh, we can pull together um, uh, our research on that and share it with the committee. Uh, Mayor I just, have, I just have a really quick question on definitions. So I had sent, I think I sent it to Matt, a, a, an article from Somerville, Mass., um, and that had a shared street. That was the, the their terminology was shared. What's the is there a difference between shared street and social? Uh, Mr. Hart, Matt Hart, town manager. I'll start off, and then I'll uh, I'll defer to Mr. Mr. McGovern. So the the shared street concept, I think, is a uh, um, has been around a little bit longer. You know that is um, how you. And it, it's, it's, it's similar. How do you slow down traffic so that you can have more uh, pedestrian activity? And typically that would involve, if you have a multi-lane road, maybe reducing the, uh, the number of lanes that are dedicated to vehicular traffic and converting another lane to a bicycle lane, pedestrian lane, um, or even a, a kind of a green space or a parklet area. The, uh, the slow street concept, as I understand it, um, is, and it can be a temporary installation that would lead to a more permanent installation. And you see this maybe more in a residential area where you only have two lanes to begin with. It's a smaller local street where you're looking to slow traffic down, maybe permit local traffic only closing it off to other traffic to the extent to which you can, local traffic only, so that it can be utilized for other purposes, for pedestrian purposes, as a play area, et cetera. Uh, so through you, Deputy Mayor, I would ask Mr. McGovern to elaborate on my response. And Mr. McGovern? Mostly right. Sure. I, I think that the biggest difference is, you know, a shared street is really a re-engineered street um through a complete streets lens where you're looking to um change dimensions add bicycle facilities do different things with parking it's like the holistic view of how you, we could um utilize a street for every possible user it's sort of like the complete streets on steroids i suppose um the slow streets really came out of the bay area because they stopped their transit system and people had to walk and bike and so they started putting in barricades at the end of streets and only allowing cars on that street, for those people that live there. So all, all the traffic was kept away because individuals had to walk or ride their bike as a means of transportation because public transportation had ceased. So all of these slow streets are on residential streets that typically lead towards a commercial district. And so um, you can see on websites and stuff, it's, it's nothing more than the same sort of barricades that we would put up for a block party. Um, and, and they're testing it out and just trying to make it safer for people to traverse the streets um, and also socially distance. Because if they stayed just on the sidewalks, they wouldn't be able to maintain social distancing requirements. So that's, that's the big difference. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Williams. Hey, Mr. Davidoff, uh, just to follow up, uh, Mr. Hart, you know, we gave you um, for the expanded authority with respect to parking um, around the center um, a couple months ago. Is 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 that authority also going to be part of the analysis here in terms of uh, looking at the roadways and how they could have a, 
economic benefit to the commercial areas as Mr. David Off brought up earlier? Uh, Matt Hart, town manager, through you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councilor Williams, uh, the, the uh, authority I think that I would rely on would be more of my existing authority as the legal traffic authority. So every town has an LTA. Um, I serve that role here in, uh, in West Hartford, although I delegate much of it to our town engineer. Um, and uh, they will bring recommendations to me, which I will sign off on. Um, with respect to the Slow Street Initiative, as Mr. McGovern explained, we will take a look at the work we've done on our traffic calming and related initiatives to identify candidates for this activity. Um, we will review those with this, uh, with this committee and look to implement them uh, relatively soon uh, through, through some sort of trial or pilot basis to see how they function. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Williams, anything further? Thank you. All right, so I think we've uh, discussed this enough. I'm sorry that we're like 25 minutes past our uh, anticipated uh, closing, but uh, it was really a very helpful um, discussion. A lot of great ideas were shared, and uh, the purpose of the uh, committee, I think, is is being met in, in this format. And in my personal opinion, I think it's better than having each of the standing committees meet uh, uh, with the limited resources of our professional staff at this point. Uh, the next item on the agenda is an open discussion as to uh, whether or not uh, counselors or other people on the call have um, other concerns that we ought to look uh, to discuss in, in a possible uh, next meeting or, or something that uh, hasn't been brought up on this agenda that you would like to see addressed. Or if there's an initiative that you would like to uh, uh, personally work on, uh, this would probably be the, the time to express the, those wishes. So. At this point, I'll just open it up to anybody who may want to uh, add in. Uh, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. David Oft. Uh, just, just quickly, as we move towards uh, the reopening, and there was discussion about masks and signage, and, and different people have different amount of um, uh, concern about uh, wearing the masks in proximity and, and, and there has been issues. So I think that to the extent we start to have problems with reporting, as was referenced earlier, maybe violations at restaurants and so forth and so on, if that becomes a real issue, maybe we should uh, have the chief come in uh, as part of this discussion. Just want to put that out there um, to the extent it becomes a problem. Hopefully it doesn't. I think, you know, that'd be great, but just in case it does. Right. So I, I think we understand that it's a, a very fluid situation and uh, we as residents need to be socially responsible and, and should should our community fall back or take uh, steps backwards, we're going to obviously need to, to make policies to, to make adjustments. And it would be appropriate to hear from, you know, our public health officials as well as our public safety officials as to uh, measures that they would recommend to, uh, to deal with. That. I think that that's a point we'll take. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Anything further? Anyone else? Mr. Mr. Gold. I'm trying to unmute. Um, so I, I kind of got from, I've gotten a lot of information. I appreciate all the information that's been set forth. Um, I take it as, you know, kind of a three-step, uh, a three-prong approach where we have a reopening, we have a reconnection, uh, kind of linking uh, the, the facets of the town together and kind of reestablishing our presence uh, in the town with all the businesses. I mean, this is an economic, uh, a forum that we're really talking about and what we really need to focus on. Um, you know, uh, Matt, we talked about slow streets as opposed to pedestrian only streets. I think pedestrian only streets help with uh, more of an economic growth uh, with with foot traffic and such. Uh, but I also pointed out earlier, and I think this is something that I would have no, I would probably like to entertain an idea and I would ask for help from whoever wants to but more of a social media type of presence that connects people. We, we you know, uh, I could talk to Ronnie, we have that com, uh, friends and neighbors, and, and maybe there can be some um, cohesion of all of those types of uh, uh, social medias as though as the arts uh, have 
their collaborative, maybe there can be a social media collaborative uh, to help foster uh, what's going on in terms of economic development. And I think that would be an important uh, part of this entire program uh, going forward uh, through this process. So I, I, I wouldn't have a mind, I would not mind moving forward in that area. Um, if there's anybody else that would want to help, I certainly would welcome that. Um, and that, that's kind of my approach. Are you raising your hand? Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. I, I, I just want to say New Haven's done a really good job of, of, of doing this. I feel like they've been sort of the model of, of doing a lot, of getting, they're, they're kind of, they are doing a lot, but also they're very, they're really good at communicating it. So might want to take a look at what they're doing. Um, we were trying to kind of do a little bit, but it, it's, we're, their staff is so much bigger. <laughs> they, and they have also consultants and uh, so we, we don't have that we don't have those resources we have everybody working so, uh, full capacity and it's just I, I, I but but you know I I would love to have that some of that what, what they're doing so well, maybe I, I, I agree and through you Mr. Davidoff that you know with our network of friends resources I'm sure we can find people in the community that are willing to help um, there might be interns that are wanting to help, things of that nature, um, you know, from college students to high school uh, students all, all across the board uh, that we could tap the resources of the town because there are plenty of people, I think, out there that are willing to help. Um, and we just have to hit the right chords and, and uh, kind of uh, play, play the right music to get them along into the process. So, Mr. Gold, I, I take it that that's what you, something that you're interested in, that you have... Uh you know, the fire in your belly to, to, to work on. And I commend you uh, for you know, stepping forward this evening and, you know, uh, obviously touch base with the manager and, and see if there could be some framework and uh, keep us posted as to, you know, what what resources or connections you might uh, need because uh, it's going to take a lot of strategy to uh, make it make it successful. So, um, you know, and, uh, you know we're, we're all here but we just have to be realistic that it's not it's not going to happen all by itself so um thank you for volunteering and, and like i said we're we're here to help and uh let us know how we can but uh, that that's that's a good start is there anyone else who wants to offer anything at this point mr winograd uh thank you mr davidoff um, a couple of points um uh one um uh, I would like to uh, hear more um, about the uh, Slow Streets Initiative, and I'll be happy to uh, be the liaison on that um, as we, um, you know, hear back on, on the reports of uh, which streets might be acceptable for it. Um, I think it's an exciting project, and I think it's something that um, we should, you know, move on soon to be able to take advantage of our so far good weather as people come out. Um, uh, but there are other issues, too, that I'm not sure fit within um, the realm of these committees. And we're having late meetings um, for a reason, because there's, there's a lot to cover. Um, I have, um, so again, I, I, so I disagree. I think we need our committees, um, it, because I think otherwise, we don't really have a forum for discussing um, other things in depth. Um, and two things that I think need to be discussed. I mean, one, um, my own issue that, you know, it, it, it was zoning. Um, that the, uh, the, um, uh, the healthcare crisis right now would make many of us be very eager to have um, an apartment in our houses where we could have a relative stay in isolation. Um, right now, those are prohibited um, by our, our zoning rules, the known as mother-in-law apartments or ADUs. Uh, um, and like, again, it has been something that's been up before. It's been recommended to us be considered by the plan of development um we don't have a forum for that right now um and i'm not sure whether that fits in i think it is a development issue a building issue a tax issue but again it doesn't really fit into these the structure um the other issue um and the other as we deal with the covid crisis we're dealing with another epidemic um nationally um of uh, these horrific cases of um uh, of uh, of racism, um, of of the, the the killings we've seen 
um, the videos, the um, uh, just a series, one after another, of these horrible incidents we've seen on video. And again, I think it's something that we need to have a public safety meeting to to talk about. Um, again, I, I, we're getting legitimate questions from people. Again, I don't, um, I don't have all the answers, and people are legitimately asking questions about our own the policies of our own police. Um, again, without accusations against anybody, but we need to investigate and make sure that the kind of stuff going on in Minneapolis couldn't happen here. And again, I'm not sure that this is the forum for that, but I think we need to have that place uh, where we can have those discussions. So there are, again, I think, you know, um, certainly not on a regularly scheduled basis, but I do think we need to be open to having committee meetings um, to have some of these discussions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Winograd. Uh, thank you for volunteering to uh, work on the uh, Slow Streets Initiative as a member of this committee to to, to, to take, sort of take the point point lead on that. Um, I've had some discussions with Mr. R on some of the zoning since I have an extensive uh, history of working on zoning and uh, I've shared some several ideas several ideas and I'd be willing to to work on some of those things and bring those to the committee to see if we could get some um, some changes. Uh, one I'll just throw out this evening uh, we. We've seen the importance of, of drive-throughs uh, and uh, how people are, are wanting to have drive-throughs for particular products and how they would have been very beneficial um, to a lot of people, whether they be in the elderly population or uh, family situations where you have to throw the kids in the car to accomplish basic things. So we really need to e evaluate our policies as to why they were, were banned and uh, not allowed unless there was some type of a special permit, but there's a lot of those things in our code that may need uh, some type of investigation as as we go forward. But and those all do uh, touch on economic uh, development. And with your third point, obviously there are um, serious social issues that are, are happening throughout our country um, that uh, do need a place in a form uh, to be heard. So um, I know I've had a conversation with Mayor Cantor about that, and we're going to have to find. Uh, the best avenue for allow people to uh, voice their concerns and to hear um, policy and elected officials' responses uh, to uh, those concerns, because you know the wrong answer is uh, just to uh, you know to, to turn the other way. Obviously, our community is uh, committed to uh, to flushing them out and making certain that uh, issues like that are are addressed, and we have a protocol and and. Uh, and a welcoming community to, to make certain that things like that don't occur in our community. And, and if they do, they are addressed appropriately. So um, thank you for raising all, all those uh, those three things this evening, Mr. Winograd. Anyone further? Uh, Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Thank David. You. Uh, not to belabor the point, but uh, Mr. Winograd uh, brings up a good issue. I think we'll all recall I know it's like three or four years ago, the West Hartford PD put together a couple of workshops on the use of force and they had, they invited the public to come in and it was exceptional. Um, so maybe, you know, th they could put together something like that for a virtual presentation. I mean, it was unbelievable. And they did that whole video with when they used the taser. And, um, but that that's just an idea to put out there, which might help with the issue that Mr. Winograd has raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, Mr. Dillo, everybody on the screen has uh, recognized that you had your hand up. I apologize sincerely that I didn't recognize you. So it's it's your turn, sir. I, I've just thank been you for your patience for, for uh, hanging out this long. No, I know I got invited to this just to look pretty here on this uh, on this Zoom call. So I appreciate it. But um, no, I, I it, it's I, let me just say it's it's an honor to. To, to be a part of this group. I, I look at the number of public servants here and everything you guys are doing um, and uh, for this town and for our community. And I'm, uh, I'm humbled and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to, to get to listen and, and hear about a lot of these issues and, and happy to help and jump in wherever I can to help out as well. I could say uh, that two years ago when my wife and I made the decision to move from Florida to come up here, um, one of the things that was really appealing, of course, was West Hartford. And um, you know, the articles we read and, and, and ever, everything we've learned since we came here two years ago has validated, um, you know, what we read and what we heard. And 
um, I am eager to help and, uh, uh, you know, as part of this community, figure out how do we continue to make this a place that attracts um, uh, uh, new residents, great businesses, et cetera. I was really heartened by the article in the Hartford Current about uh, maybe sort of the post-COVID world, um, how work is changing and, and more and more folks from New York City may be looking for uh, other areas to, um, to call home because now they can work from home for four days a week and maybe just go into the city for a couple. And so whatever we can do, I think, to, uh, to market to them and to continue to improve. And I, I'm a firm believer, having grown up in a European city myself, where uh, you know every weekend you spend time on Kärntnerstrasse in Vienna, which was a walking only street. Um, I, I saw, um, I, I just, I believe in, in that pedestrian and bike friendly city uh, philosophy. And uh, I've lived in St. Petersburg, Florida and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the highlights of those of those communities were the Friday night, um, they closed the streets down and they had a concert. Obviously, we're a little bit away from that right now. Um, but um, I think that's the, you know, personally, I think that's the future for, for places like West Hartford. And uh, so I'm happy to help out in any way. Lee, I'll join you and partner with you on that important project um, and do what I can to help. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dillo, for uh, for uh, joining our group and welcome aboard because, uh, as we said, there's many people in our community that uh, want to get involved and they currently don't know how uh, they can and use their, their talents and we're most appreciative and we'll definitely uh, take you up on your offer to assist and I'm really glad this evening that you got my memo that uh, it was pink shirt night tonight, so thank you, sir. <laughs> So is there anything further from any member of, uh, of the uh, group that's here? Uh, seeing uh, nothing and receiving no other text, I think I want to just thank you for your time. Um, I don't know if the mayor or uh, Mr. Hart has anything further to end before we uh, close, or have anything to add before we end, I'm sorry. I, no, I, I just will say thank you for, I know we've had two really long of these meetings and there has a lot, been a lot to catch up on, I think. I think going forward, there will be a, a little bit, a little bit more streamlined. Um, I do think, I'm not sure the committee meetings and breaking us up is necessarily, um, I will talk to you, Ben, more, but if, if we need it, we need it and we will do them. But um, as far as the uh, police issue, um, Matt, I, we were going to talk about that tomorrow. I don't know if we are. Well, I text you. I don't know. <laughs> but um, but we need we need to educate. We need to have a public uh, forum. Um, we need to have that discussion. So um, we will do that. And I don't I don't think that should be necessarily a public safety meeting. I, I think that's a, a broader discussion. Thank you, Eric. Wonderful, but thank you all very much. I, it's been a lot of staff time and it's late. So again, I thank you all, Chris and Mark, especially. Thank you. Um, thank you. And Mr. Tom. Did you have something else, Mr. Roy? No. Mr. Hart, did you have anything else? Uh, yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Matt Hart, town manager. Just to echo the mayor's comments, want to thank everybody for their time tonight. And, you know, the, the, the conversation regarding uh, police brutality in, in the, uh, the incidents of, of racism that, that we've seen. Uh, that is a very important conversation that we need to have. Uh, I have had some preliminary conversations with uh, Chief Command today. We'll have more tomorrow, and Mayor will be reaching out to schedule a, t a time with you. Uh, West Hartford PD, uh, as was mentioned earlier, has done a lot of very good work in this regard but it's, it's something we can always continuously improve on. We can never let our guard down. It's, it's a very critical issue for us. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Anyone further? All right, so thank you, Ms. Korsky, Mr. McGovern for joining us, and thank you, uh, Mr. Dillo, for being here. Nice to meet you via uh, WebEx. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hart. Thank you to all my council colleagues, and we'll adjourn the meeting. Be safe, have a great weekend, everyone.